ready? Welcome to Voice. From the main stage to our breakout sessions to the expo hall, I think we had more than 500 companies speaking at this conference. It has become the place where the global voice first communities are coming together. There's just so many affordances that speech give us. It's the first time in my life that my kids are just as excited and up to speed on the tech as my parents, right? This would reduce your balance to about $15,000. That is the experience you want to have when you introduce conversational AI. 2019 sales to date are up 2.1%. How do you use voice and empathy and build that into an experience that's going to work in a healthcare context? from people who are developing gaming applications, and we learn from that. So the cross-industry pollination, very important and very helpful for us. Coming back one year later and seeing how much this conference has grown, how many more women, frankly, I'm seeing in this space, has been really like impactful to me personally. I think very valuable for Boom as a company to find so many great people to meet and potentially partner with. The talent now better understand what it is that they need to do and how they can participate in this new world of voice first and AI. The world is changing so fast. The voice, the augmented reality, virtual reality, this is gonna be huge. This is the inaugural Voice Summit Awards. This community is innovating at a pace that I don't think any industry has ever seen before. I want us to all give a round of applause for the people in this room that are changing the world. The thing I love most is watching all the connections, all the smiles, seeing all the tweets of people having a great time together. My definition of voice is the ability to empower others. It's time to take this to another level where you and I can make an even bigger impact. To the 5,000 people that came from more than 26 countries, five continents, every state in this union, from me to you, thank you very much. Do you feel in control of your own destiny? Technology drives progress, allowing mankind to make and remake the world for greater authority over our lives. What comes next will make you feel in control of your destiny. And all you need is the voice you already have. Voice is the easiest way to create and monetize content at scale. Your productivity will skyrocket as you get things done at the speed of speech. Voice technology as your new operating system gives you and every other living human great control over your own destiny. Visit attn.live now to create your own connected and abundant future.
to voice. From the main stage to our breakout sessions to the expo hall, I think we had more than 500 companies speaking at this conference. It has become the place where the global voice first communities are coming together. There's just so many affordances that speech give us. It's the first time in my life that my kids are just as excited and up to speed on the tech as my parents, right? This would reduce your balance to about $15,000. That is the experience you want to have when you introduce conversational AI. 2019 sales to date are up 2.1%. How do you use voice and empathy and build that into an experience that's gonna work in a healthcare context? from people who are developing gaming applications, and we learn from that. So the cross-industry pollination, very important and very helpful for us. Coming back one year later and seeing how much this conference has grown, how many more women, frankly, I'm seeing in the space, has been really like impactful to me personally. I think very valuable for Boom as a company to find so many great people to meet and potentially partner with. The talent now better understand what it is that they need to do and how they can participate in this new world of voice first and AI. The world is changing so fast. Voice, the like augmented reality, virtual reality, this is going to be huge. This is the inaugural Voice Summit Awards. This community is innovating at a pace that I don't think any industry has ever seen before. I want us to all give a round of applause for the people in this room that are changing the world. The thing I love most is watching all the connections, all the smiles, seeing all the tweets of people having a great time together. My definition of voice is the ability to empower others. It's time to take this to another level where you and I can make an even bigger impact. To the 5,000 people that came from more than 26 countries, five continents, every state in this union, from me to you, thank you very much. You ready? Welcome to Voice. From the main stage to our breakout sessions to the expo hall, I think we had more than 500 companies speaking at this conference. It has become the place where the global voice first communities are coming together. There's just so Ideas many affordances. and networking around this thing we call voice, right? This is a fascinating time. I was able to walk the floors, the North Hall and the South Hall, and, and see so many technologies. And it's, it's wild to see how many things around us are now, we're, we're able now to interact with, with voice, right? My takeaway is the world is electric, it's autonomous, and it's voice activated. And today we're gonna talk about that voice, whether it's talking to an assistant or a chatbot, uh, or in our car, or on a bicycle or you know it's starting to permeate all around our lives. So I'm super excited about today because we have a collection of individuals and brands that are pushing the envelope and pushing the limits on what's possible uh, with this new interaction regardless of platform or device. I want to thank all of our sponsors for being a part of this and coming on this journey with us our first year to do this at CES. It has been a great journey. We've learned a ton and excited to be here. So let's thank our title sponsor first off. Let's thank the Google Assistant team for the title ship. Thank you. Thank you, Google. Thank you. Thank you to the whole team and for, for making this happen. And then all of our, our other sponsors who you're going to hear from me and meet in the back of the room. Let's give it up for all of our other sponsors. You see them here on the, on the board as well. These things are not possible uh, without, without our sponsors. And what's neat about sponsors that we have is they are deeply ingrained in this space. They are experts in this. Um, when we walked into the room, you heard some music. That is the sonic brand of voice of this event. I want to uh, point out uh, Audrey Arbini from Audio Brain, who developed that for us this, uh, in 2019 for our 2019 Voice Summit. Audrey, let's give a wave, please. You are going to hear. 
you're going to hear from Audrey at the end of the day uh, with Whirlpool about what it means to have a sonic uh, brand and a sonic identity. So that's enough for me. We've got a really packed day. The schedule's going to go very fast. We started a little bit late. We understand that a lot of you had a hard time getting through and getting in, and I know a lot of other people are still out there in line. But we're going to get started, and I am super thrilled to bring up our opening keynote uh, from Google. You know, it's very easy for us just to talk to a device and have it all happen. But behind the scenes, it's unbelievable what has to happen. And this gentleman knows what has to happen because he makes it happen. Let's give it up for Scott Huffman, the Vice President of Google Assistant. Scott, thank you. Right. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, Pete. Am I, am I on? Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for, for coming out and uh, braving the registration line, I guess, uh, to be here. Um, you know, not surprisingly at Google, we're, we're very excited about uh, voice. Do I have like a clicker or something, by the way? Uh, we're very excited. I thought today what might be useful would be to go through for about three years now. A few of them learned about how users interact with voice, how it changes the way that they interact, and then some of the things that we're investing in uh, and excited about for the future, uh, especially as it relates to partners and developers uh, who want to build on, on the assistant. Oh, here we go. Thank you so much. All right, and there's lots of buttons on here, so we'll see if I push the right one. Okay, so that's me. Um, I'm the VP of Engineering at Google Assistant, uh, and I think what that means is I have like a pretty fun job of getting to see uh, a lot of this voice technology over the years develop uh, hand in hand with kind of our natural language uh, and dialogue understanding, uh, and so it's, it's been really fun. Now this is I use internally all the time, uh, just to try result is something that we call orchestration, uh, and all it really means is that, the, I always say the assistant doesn't really do anything. Uh, all it does is connect the user uh, to all the things that many of you build, uh, and that other parts of Google build, and so on, and other devices uh, in order to get things done in the world or get information that, that the user wants. So one thing I'm really excited about, we, of course all of us, we work in this industry, really it is, I can tell you, I see all the warts. Uh, and all the things that don't we just crossed this milestone uh, recently of having 500 million monthly active users uh, on the Google Assistant. So for me, just even as like a computer scientist who's been working in this language and speech space for many years, it's pretty amazing, actually, to think about that you know, 500 million people in over 30 different languages, 90 different countries around the world will have a conversation with Google using their voice over the next month to get something done, or at least to try to get something done uh, with the assistant. And so we're, we're I think the, the point of the statistic for me really is there's something there, right? This technology, which people have been working on for decades, we're reaching that place where normal human beings can actually use it to do something useful. And I mentioned that the assistant doesn't really do anything. It just connects to other people. This poll product wouldn't be possible at all without all the amazing partners that we have uh, that have really uh, stepped up and built experiences with the assistant user. partners who are on this journey with us. Now, one other way besides integrating with partners that Google's investing uh, in the voice space is something we call the Assistant Fund, uh, where we're investing in uh, startups that are in the space. Uh, and you see the, the, the 16 investors around the tools 
uh, and vertical experiences. We're really excited about voice for many years. In fact, the slide kind of goes only back to 2008. It could come like over here somewhere. Uh, And then in 2019, uh, what really focused on the real I think is really the highlight for me is around on uh, where what we're seeing is that uh, we're starting to be able to create uh, neural models that can be Is that I think the world will evolve to more on-device uh, technology and maybe somewhat of a hybrid uh, approach where some computing will happen on the device, some things will be handled in the cloud. Uh, interestingly, that I mean that for me was the big exciting thing. The thing that got like the most applause on stage at I/O was the next one, uh, which is Simple Stop, uh, which is just this thing that when the alarm's going off, you can just say stop. Uh, I will say it does get used every single day in my house, so it's a uh, it's a pretty life changing uh, one, as as simple as it is. But it shows kind of the power of the on device idea, right? That 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 stop is just handled completely on the device, and over time we're imagining that more and more commands in, with, in whatever context uh, the device is in might be, be becoming available. All right, so it's the beginning of the year. That means that uh, it was just Q4, and maybe for many of you, your company works like my company works, which is that at the end of the year, you do all your planning for the next year. So we've just been through our, our 2020 planning cycle, uh, and as part of that, we sat down with Sundar, uh, who I'm sad to say does not look nearly that happy whenever I talk to him uh, as he looks in this photo. So if I could make him look that happy, boy, that would be good. Uh, but, uh, but we had our, our kind of year-end uh, review of the job. That's good. Uh, but more seriously, Sundar and his team are really excited about voice and uh, continuing to invest here. Uh, it's, a, it's really a major strategic area for Google. Uh, I think that came across in I.O. last year with all the different voice announcements uh, that were there. Uh, and if anything, really, Sundar is very much in a mode of doubling down here. I think, I think we all see this, but uh, just w within Google, I think there really is a sense of hey, voice, could voice be really the next way that people interact with information and services, right? And, uh, and where, if you think we've kind of gone from, you know, a personal computer in, at my desk to a phone in my pocket, are we now getting to the age where we have ambient computing where, uh, where voice becomes a primary interface? And so Sundar is, is very bullish on continuing to invest there. The other thing that we spent a lot of time on, actually, in our review with Sundar this year was around... Uh, the developer ecosystem for voice, and what investments are we making? I'll talk about some of that uh, in order to really make it uh, continue to drive this ecosystem and help uh, our development partners uh, build great experiences for users and plug into the assistant. Uh, and that's, that's really a hot topic for, uh, for Sundar and his team. All right, so like I mentioned in the beginning, I thought what I might do with, with some of our time here, we've been at this, this uh, assistant thing for about three and a half years, I guess, we've been in the marketplace now. Uh, and I thought it would be interesting to go through some of the things that we've seen around how vo a voice interaction, maybe it feels how users uh, use it, than what we see with search and our other products. So some of our, our key learnings. Uh, let me just start with this one. One thing that we see very in a very marked way is, is really about action. Uh, you know, 
Uh, if this, this is what's on the screen. I don't have like a deep theory of why this is. I'll tell you my armchair psychologist theory is like if you let people talk to you, then they just wanna tell you what to do. I don't know. At least in my life, I have some people like that. I don't know if any of you do. But, but uh, I think when we open the mic, people start to do that. And so that's, that's I think, a big opportunity uh, for us as developers uh, to be able to provide those actions and, and fulfill what users are looking for. A second learning uh, is that voice really calls for conversationality. Uh, what we see is that users, when the, you have that open microphone, they don't speak, for example, in keyword ease, Google ease. They don't use, you know, they don't stick to some bounds of something you could write down in a regular expression, some nice uh, way to say things. They say things all sorts of different ways. I like the example that, that's here. Maybe you could say, what's what, like, one of the voice assistants does? Well, it sets up, that's easy. But you better wake me up at six, that's the actual command. Uh, and so we're expected to understand that. Uh, and what we're seeing that's really exciting for me is as the product, as, as speech recognition and language understanding improve, people get more daring. And they, they, they begin to vary how they talk, expect multi-step conversation and so on. So voice calls for action uh, and it demands conversationality. A third learning is that uh, voice really becomes a part of people's daily routine uh, in a really interesting way. And this graph is showing, kind of comparing uh, our home usage to our phone usage. At home, in the morning, you have a huge spike of things that people need to get ready for. So productivity is kind of our word for like, Evening, you see the spike in media where people are now at home, they're ready to relax, and they're asking to hear their favorite playlist, to continue to watch their video, and so on. Um, so what, what gets us excited about this is that, you know, people really discover the things that are important to them through the day, uh, and voice is an easy way for them to use it across the different, uh, the different modalities and surfaces that we have, and so it becomes a part of their daily life in a really interesting way. And then the last one here I wanted to call out is just the universality of voice. You know, I, we're all, we've all been in this technology and start the kind of people who would show up at CES, right? Sorry, no offense, nerd, okay? So it would kind of start to take the technology. Uh, and then over time, it becomes more and more mainstream. One thing we've been really fascinated to see with voice is that it hasn't really followed that same pattern from what we can see. And in fact, really from the beginning, we're seeing a huge amount of adop adoption across age groups, across families, across genders, across 
uh, across uh, locations and languages in the world. The picture here is, is to remind me to say that just as one example, uh, in India we've seen incredible growth of use of voice uh, as many new users come online for the first time. And, and for many of those users, their first connected device is uh, a low-end kind of phone, uh, maybe what we call a feature phone, but a lot of those feature phones come with a big voice button in the middle. Uh, and so those users are learning from the beginning, oh, voice is actually the interface to computing and to, and to, to apps and services, uh, and sort of thinking that way from the very start of their, of, their connected, of their connected usage. So voice brings users to do actions. They expect it to be conversational. Uh, it's universal. Um, and so, so we're excited about these properties of voice uh, that we see as a little bit different from other apps and things that we've built. Okay, so if those are the learnings of the last, uh, whatever it is, three and a half years that we've been, that we've been at this, uh, I wanted to think a little bit about, okay, well, like, what are we gonna learn next? Kind of, what, we're, we're at the beginning of 2020, what are, what are some of the things that, uh, that we're kind of uh, change this going forward, in particular around how to develop for voice. And so I wanted to call out a, a couple things here. The first one is that, uh, you know, speakers can be quite limited, uh, something without a screen. We think that screens, whether it's on phones, smart displays, uh, will begin to change what uh, experience users with voice. Secondly, And third is kind of the, there's no magic. Uh, discovering and helping users discover those voice capabilities is gonna require investment, both from uh, platforms like Google and from all of you as you're, as you're creating those things for your users. So let's just walk through, through each, each of those. The first one here, screens will change everything. And one one uh, thing that we were, I'll be honest, we started, As you see this stat there, about half the time, they will then continue on with an experience that uh, mixes voice and touch. Uh, and we found that pretty interesting, right? I think it's a big opportunity for us as we think about how we develop great voice experiences that you have an opportunity that's multimodal, um, where you have a visual, you have touch, and you have voice. And I call it an opportunity because I think, uh, you know, as much as we love speakers, speakers are great, uh, but the experience that you can have purely in a vocal domain is fairly limited, right? And so this really opens up, I think, new possibilities. And we're beginning to see some developers take advantage of this. Let me just give you a couple examples. Uh, so we, we have a development uh, system called Canvas that allows you to build on essentially an HTML-based uh, experience that, that is voice-enabled for a smart display. And Disney took this and built there a read-along and kind of character for Frozen 2. Here's another example. It's called the 3% Challenge, built by Dopio. Uh, there's a hit, hit Netflix show here, and this thing is an experience, uh, an interactive prequel uh, kind of storyline. Interactivity with other people. Uh, and again, just a, a richer kind of experience than you can create with voice alone. So we think we're gonna see a lot more of that in 2020 uh, and encourage you to kind of think about uh, how to, those multimodal experiences uh, can, reach user, can reach your users. All right, second, second uh, I don't know what it is, prediction for 2020, uh, or thing that we're investing in, is once you have that visual piece, we think it's a lot uh, more possible to start from the great things that you've already built. Um, for many of you, you're, and many, many developers, the company has, uh, you know, a 
mobile web. We've come along as the voice, these voice platforms that said, so far we've kind of said, yeah, that's great that you had that thing. Now please like start over and learn this new thing and build these new things. Now, I'm not, we're gonna keep, please keep building new things. Uh, but also we've, we've been thinking a lot about and starting, just starting the, can we voice enable uh, the websites and apps that you have? So just to give a couple examples, one really nice example for me actually is the recipe experience on smart displays. I don't know uh, any of you know this, but a lot the, we have a in our kitchen uh, this afternoon. on the Google smart displays is basically the web uh, based versions of the recipes have markup of various kinds in them around the steps uh, and the ingredients and so on. And we're basically taking that markup and reformatting and optimizing the experience for the smart display user. Uh, and even doing things like step-by-step uh, step-by-step directions and so on that people can hear verbally while their hands are busy and they're cooking. Uh, but really without a huge amount of new development from our recipe partners. Uh, and so I think that's a pattern that uh, we'd love to expand on is if you're a content publisher, we're looking at what are some ways that we can make your content really shine in people's living rooms, people's uh, kitchens as, they, as they're using these devices. Now an example that goes a step further uh, is we're beginning to look at how the assistant can actually automate more transactional things that uh, exist on the web uh, as the assistant maybe has address, my payment credential, and so on. Can we actually help you through the process in this example, for example, of, of buying movie tickets at Fandango? Uh, and this is a technology that we talked about at Google I.O. We call it duplex on, on the web. So we have duplex our system that makes phone calls for users. This is sort of a similar idea, but of automating the steps uh, of doing that transaction on a website. Uh, and, the re and partners like Fandango are very excited about this because what they're seeing is that the conversion rate from the kind of the beginning of that flow uh, through, in this, in this case, the purchasing tickets, we actually see a pretty nice uplift through this automation of getting people through that flow. Uh, and so that's where uh, the partners who, who we've started with here get pretty excited because you know, you, well, if you know how much work people put into optimizing those flows to get those conversions to happen, and this is another tool that helps them do that. And I'll talk about the app side, uh, and this is, this is something that we're really just at the beginning of, but we work on how to provide a deep linkage into the right spot in your app in order to make something happen. Uh, and you'll see us rolling this out across more and more domains and more and more uh, kinds of interactions over time. But again, trying to at least voice enable that first step into your app uh, and get you to the right spot. So in this example, right, I say, hey, order a signature latte from Dunkin' Donuts, uh, and I go right to the or kind of ordering page with the right thing in my, uh, in my card and I can complete my order. Now, I thought it'd be cool to do this as like a live demo for all of you. Uh, but then we realized that like bringing in 300 lattes might be a little awkward. Uh, so instead we brought in 300 donuts. They're here in the back, so they're, they're, they're unveiled. The unveiling of the donuts, very exciting. So please, uh, please go back and grab a donut when you get a chance. All right, so we've talked about uh, building on what you already have, the fact that screens are really gonna provide new opportunities to reach users. The third one I thought I'd call out here uh, is that discoverability solve problem. I, I would love to be with Sundar. I kind of want to your users magically know what to say. I didn't find the dust. I'm still looking for it. If any of you have it, please give it to me so we can do that. But the reality is discoverability is going to continue to take an investment from us uh, in terms of providing the hooks that allow discoverability and from you as you build things and then market those things to your users to help them understand what capability uh, is there. Now one, one of the hooks that we're uh, providing here is, link, is just simply linking from on the phone into the action. Uh, so in this example, right, there's a link that 
uh, shows up in the website, you see this little assistant button there, and when the user taps that, it leads into the action that this publisher has created within the Google Assistant. Simple idea. I, I guess I think of it a little, little bit like, you know, if you have a website, a lot of sites use their website to promote downloading their app. This is a little bit of a similar kind of idea. You're at the website, hey, can, we ch can uh, you use that to make users aware of what they can do within the Assistant? Now, once you have that, obviously, you can do things like uh, promote those things within your social, uh, within your Tweet out, uh, people can vote, and now tweet links that lead directly into that, into the voting experience that, that they've created. where the Warriors play, so I don't know who to vote for this year. Uh, I guess I'll just vote for LeBron, like everyone else. But. All right, so, and then the last one I'll just call out here is that we're continuing to, to work on improving uh, the That all of you are creating. All right, so, so I know a good talk, I, I've had all the same coaching all of you have had, I know a good talk is supposed to have like three points at most, uh, but I thought, you know, we're here in Las Vegas, seven's a lucky number, so I'm gonna have seven points. Okay, so, so just to review them, we're super excited about voice because we see that it produces a different kind of behavior in users uh, that gives it a real opportunity to do something new for users. It's about they call for actions, they expect conversationality, voice starts to get knitted into their daily routines, and we see it that it's universal across different kinds of users than we see typically with an early technology. And so all those things get us excited. And then in 2020, we think that screens provide opportunity to make a richer engagement with users. Uh, you can, it opens up the opportunity to start to voice enable the great assets you already have. And we need to work together as a community to keep working and pounding away on discoverability uh, and the hooks that we need to create that. All right, so the one other message I wanna uh, leave you with is that one thing we're feeling is that as one of the uh, platforms in this space, we're really working to make ourselves more available to this community uh, and, uh, and really hear what people are looking for, uh, be responsive to that. Uh, and to talk about that, I'm gonna invite Danny, who's our, our partner's lead, uh, to talk about some of the ways we're gonna try to be more available to you. Thank you, Scott. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Danny Bernstein, and I'm really excited to be able to talk to you all today. Um, if Scott is the computer scientist working on Google Assistant. I may be a little bit more of the relationship scientist. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's just great to have this group of people who are thinking about voice, who are thinking about this nascent space together in one room. And we all know that you actually had to uh, spend a little bit more money to be here. Uh, and presentation issue, something about the Um, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll distract you with some really exciting little information while, you're, while they're bringing up the right presentation. Um, we know it was an investment for you to be here, and so one of the things we wanted to do is actually have you uh, go home with a Google device. So within the next couple of hours, the Google Nest Hub, our, our seven-inch smart display, we're going to have one for each of you to take home today. So just wanted to mention that. <laughs> Um, I can do this without slides. So, as I said, my, my name is Danny. Um, I've been at Google for over seven years. I've been working on the Google Assistant for three and a half years. And like many of you in the room, you know, I've really kind of dedicated at this point my career to this nascent space. 
and, and it, you know, we're in Las Vegas, I'm all in on voice. And, and I'm super passionate about this, I know many of you are as well. And, and my team uh, in the partnerships uh, landscape at Google, we work with large companies like Disney and Starbucks. We also work with emerging companies in the space uh, like Volley, like, like Matchbox, um, and, and then also agencies like Rain and Nook I, I've seen here today. And so we kind of cover that whole landscape. We also are working on um, voice integrations, like these full end-to-end -end voice integrations, like the Frozen example you saw. And we're also working on these, these newer kind of integrations that take advantage or plug into your existing web and, and app. And, and so we kind of cover different spectrums, large and small, native and existing. And, and one of the things we realized um, last year was that we had to be much more out in the community. And, and there are a couple of catalysts for this. And one of the catalysts for this is that we're not that new of a product anymore. We've been in the market now for over three years. And so we have a little bit of a better sense of what it means to build a digital assistant. And during those first few, year, first few years, we, it's not that we weren't out in the market, but we just didn't have as much certainty about how do we partner, what are the ways we can be partnering. And I have this um, phrase I use internally, which will mean something to uh, a lot of people in the room, but maybe not the slightly younger demographic. But one thing Google can't do is build Acme versions of its products. Does that mean, any does that mean anything to anyone in this room? So Wile E. Coyote, when he was chasing the Roadrunner, of course, um, would always buy these Acme products. And they were generic. They were knockoffs. And he would never buy the branded version. And the equivalent would be if Google tried to build everything, we would have like Google, you know, whatever, Run Club, rather than the Nike Run Club. Well, like that wouldn't be as good. You want to be using Nike. You want to be, you want to have Disney characters, not Google Mickey Mouse. Like that's not, that's like Acme, right? So there's this clear idea inside of our company that we really need to partner because users on the assistant expect that the, the services they use will be there. It's like a really basic idea. And that's something that we really care about a lot. And so, Thinking about how we do that, but thinking how we do it in a really smart way, a bunch of us kind of kicked off a bit of a listening tour uh, last year. I know that's a little bit of a cliche phrase at this point, but we got out there and we started to ask questions of a bunch of companies. We went to larger companies like Televisa, like Nike, et cetera, and we asked them, what can we be doing better? We also talked to a bunch of agencies, and I'll mention a couple of those examples here today. And we even went to some consultants, um, examples like Susan Westwater, who a bunch of you probably know, who quit her job at an agency and decided that she was going to be full-time on voice before voice was really even a thing. And, and to kind of get out there and hear these things, I wanted to share a couple of insights that I heard that I think will resonate with a lot of you who are just kind of building your careers in voice and are maybe thinking about pushing those chips all in on voice. The first is that it's really clear that Fortune 1000 companies are looking for trusted advisors. And they're looking for a couple of different kinds of trusted advisors. They're looking for of you. Um, they're looking for people who are going to kind of get trained, who are going to be attending things like this today, who are going to be connected into Google and Amazon, etc., to be kind of brushing up on these things, to be building these competencies. And they're also looking for outside help, increasingly. Um, what we think is that there are going to be a bunch of major brands in 2020 who are going to be hiring a voice agency of record. We actually know of a couple of examples already where this is happening with household name brands. And this is an incredible concept, right? Because we, we know the idea of hiring a digital agency or a mobile agency of record. But now there's this new idea, which is we need a voice agency of record. And they're going to be looking at the traditional agencies, the digitases, et cetera, to do this. But they're also going to be looking at agencies that are boutique to be able to bring on these sorts of relationships as well. This is a fascinating development. And with the other thing that we're seeing as well, so there's the, there's, the, there's the one side of the marketplace, which is the large co, and then you also have the other side of the marketplace, which are these agencies and these consultants. And, and we're just seeing so many interesting developments happening here. I met, mentioned the example of, of people who are leaving traditional agencies to kind of bootstrap these new, these new areas. And, and they're, they're clear, these, these sorts of um, consultants are looking for closer collaborations with us. They're saying, like, we need to, we need to like, get in with you, Google. We need to learn from you. We need to be more kind of plugged into what you're doing. And so we've been thinking a lot about how, can we, how we can respond to that. We've already been partnering with agencies 
around the world and working on voice projects with them. So we've been learning a lot here kind of to reflect on if you're not, let's say, an in-house developer or if you are a smaller agency working with lots of different brands, like what are your needs? And we worked with uh, Rain on a Nike shoe drop that was like massive and was covered on TV. You can see B Next here where they created Carnival Brazil and then Nook who's Tabs and inside of retailers as well. So there's so much interesting uh, kind of development happening in this space. Like we couldn't be more excited about it, and we just want to know like everything that's going on. And and so one thing I've said to some of the agencies I've gotten to know is just like ping us. Like you're working on something, please just like get in touch. We want to understand it. We want to be able to help you. We want to be able to support you. Our product managers have elephant skin. They want to they want to hear like everything that's working and everything that isn't. Um, you have to have thick skin in this space, right? Voice is really humbling. It's one of my favorite little sayings. Voice is really humbling because we're all trying to figure out like sort of what's going on. So one thing that we're going to be doing is um, certification programs. So this is something that we've heard a lot of feedback from partners to do. The question is, what's the right way? Um, and so recognize and create a, a certification sort of these trusted advisors. Um, we think it's important. We want to recognize uh, agencies like Rain and Nook who are investing wisely. We think that makes a lot of sense. Um, we want to be able to say to a brand who calls on us, like there's this question that you've heard a thousand times, where do I begin in voice? Does that sound pretty familiar? Where do I begin in voice? We should make t-shirts. Where do I begin in voice? That, the question, we want to be able to say to brands that we work with in other capacities, obviously like advertising, if you're looking for where to begin in voice, here are a couple of ideas. Just be able to answer that basic question. We also are thinking, this is a lot of feedback we've gotten, we don't know exactly how to do this yet, is to extend these certifications to non-technical competencies. Scott talked about the criticality of discoverability. Well, that's kind of like a marketer's challenge in many ways, right? It's a technical challenge, but it's also a marketer's challenge. And so we also want to be able to say, how am I marketing my action? How am I marketing my experience? We also want to be able to point people to trusted advisors in that capacity as well. So the reason that we're not like fully announcing this yet today is we actually need more feedback on this and how to do it in the right way. So we're going to be doing a little more listening around how to approach this problem, but it's something that we plan to roll out this year. In the meantime, like members of the ecosystem, I think you all have gotten a pretty clear message from me if you haven't already. Like we really want to be working with you. We really want to get this right. So please continue to give us feedback so when we roll some of these things out, we do it in the right way. We've also heard from partners that like they need to just be much more plugged into like what we're up to. So being here is an example of that, and there are a couple of other ways that we're going to be rolling that out this year. Um, we we want to make it just much more clear where we're going from a business to business or an industry standpoint. It's a little trickier on the consumer side. Map, I think you can understand why. But from an industry standpoint, from a developer standpoint, we think there are some best practices that we can follow, even from some other Google products, um, that, that can basically clue partners in in the industry more about a little bit where we're going so you can invest wisely. I think when you meet with us one-on-one, -on -one, we're like extremely open, but that doesn't necessarily scale because we can't just do that with every partner on the planet. We just not enough hours in the day. We're not a big enough team. So we're thinking about this. Um, so the kinds of things we want to be able to tell you about is like, where are our analytics going? Where are our measurement tools going? Where is our voice development environment going? We want to be able to give you those sorts of hints, and we also want to be able to do that so then you can react to it. And so there are a couple things we're thinking about. One thing we're thinking about is that we plan to share more of our roadmap on a consistent basis, even before it's actually uh, live in the product. Something that we doing it, and we get a really strong negative or positive reaction from the industry, it's also possible that we can contemplate if we're making the right decision. So this is the one thing we're thinking about. So similar to the certification program, we're also thinking about, like, what's the best way to approach this problem? So we're going to be looking at best practices internally and externally, but we also want to hear from you all about what's really useful. Uh, we started to do this in some informal settings, but we're, we are definitely looking for more feedback because this is something that 
people seem to think is a reasonably good idea. The next one, and we're starting out today, is we're actually going to be just out there a lot more. So a lot of people tell me, like, Google, gosh, it's sort of like a, a faceless organization. It just seems so big. You know, who, how can I actually meet anyone? I met this one person. They sort of disappeared. We're going to be at a lot more conferences in the voice space. And, and um, this is incredibly exciting for us to be able to support the work of Pete and Bradley and, and Brett and others. And, and we just want to be out there. And, and we're constantly looking for other places where we should be showing up, where members of the voice community are gathering. So I think something we're also looking for feedback on is, let's say you sit in a local market like Japan or Germany or whatever it might be, and you're seeing something happen. Or the other thing that's happening, for example, in Latin America, we're seeing a bit of a gap where there isn't that voice conference that's necessarily scheduled. So we're getting together with a couple of agencies and a couple of partners who might be planning something ourselves. So we just think that like at this nascent stage of the voice community, being able to assemble is like a really We're actively investing. We've done 16 investments from the Google Assistant Fund, and we're really interested to hear ideas. And, and if it doesn't make sense for us to invest for whatever reason, we probably want to be like working with you in some other capacity, or, or at least understanding what you're doing, because we can learn from you, you can learn from us. And, um, and then lastly, on technical support. We have, a, we have a technical support form. It's pretty easy to find. Um, we just wanted to put these things out there. So um, that's really it for today. Grab a donut. Uh, pretty soon you'll have some hardware and, and take it home and un unbox it and look at our website to think about how to develop. But honestly, we really just appreciate so much that you're here, that you're thinking about voice, that you're thinking about um, your role in the ecosystem, Google's role in the ecosystem. It's such an early time. It's such an exciting time yesterday about this. And, and voice is still pretty small, but the quality of the people you meet is really, really high. You know, it feels like an early stage startup that's like going somewhere, where you might be 50 people, 60 people, but the quality of the individuals is really high, lots of integrity, doing it for the right reasons. They're interested in doing something new and something interesting, and that really feels like voice right now. So I just want to thank everybody for the attention for being here, and have a great rest of your uh, session at CES. Thanks, everybody. Annie, that was excellent. Thank you so much. All right, so I just found out some great news. I have a golden ticket in my hand. And if, has anybody been over to the Google Assistant experience over there by the convention center? I was there yesterday. The line to get in that experience was down the escalator and out. It, and I, I couldn't wait in that line long enough. I had to go do the slide. I did do the slide. But we have a golden ticket for everybody in this room to actually go bypass that line and get through the Google, Google Assistant experience. So definitely do that. Let's thank Google. Golden tickets. Golden tickets are in the back of the room. So definitely, definitely grab one. So many donuts, golden tickets, devices. This day is just getting better and better. And now, how, yes, yes, absolutely. I love it. I love a day that gets better and better. By the way, we're ending the day with a party. You're all invited. It's going to be at Park MGM at the Juniper Lounge. Uh, we'll give you instructions with how to get there, but you will, we will ask you to RSVP. You can find that RSVP on our website, voicesummit.ai slash CES. Um, and then one more quick announcement, our hashtag, voice2020 is our hashtag. We also put it, we uh, couple it up then followed by voice, I mean, uh, CES2020. So if you see the traffic out there on Twitter or Instagram, uh, you will find that hashtag. All right, let's get this show moving. And like I said, when we started off, we had to push back a little bit because of the challenges getting in. We're going to be running a tight schedule. We're a little bit off, but uh, thank you for your patience on that. How many love research? I'm a huge consumer of research. I read it a lot. We have some amazing researchers in this room with us right now, uh, some you know very well. And I'd like to bring up Tom Webster, the vice president of uh, Edison Research, to give us a little bit of a taste of some of the newest research they have, and then we're going to go into a panel discussion with some very well-known people. Tom, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Are we supposed to?
If you were busy last week, while, while many of you were celebrating holidays, we were diligently actually conducting research. Well, I wasn't. I, was, I slept a lot. But some people in my office did a lot of research uh, to update a study that we have done for the last three years now in partnership with NPR. Uh, we've been working with NPR actually uh, for about four years uh, under the aegis of the Smart Audio Report to look at America's adoption and voices. Americans 18 plus. It's about a quarter of the country. We've really been tracked since the beginning of 2017. Um, and if you look at the trend of that growth, One, but the number of devices that they own, and I'm, I'm rarely surprised by numbers in my business. I was surprised that this one went up. I expected this to go down as more people. Audio and it's putting computing into rooms of the house and environments where it previously did not exist, right? And so these are sort of new behaviors that Americans are learning, and they're putting more and more of these devices in their home. And so when you look at the percentage in penetration and also the number of devices that people own, uh, you can see the number of smart speakers in households has grown by 105% in just two years. So more people are getting these devices them in more and more rooms of the house. Tech. And for the first time, over half of Americans say they've ever used some kind of voice command, whether that's uh, Siri, Google Assistant, Alexa devices, Bixby, the whole gamut. 54% of U.S. adults 18 to plus say they've ever done this. And amongst those who say they have done it, amongst that 54%, about a quarter say they do it every day. These behaviors are becoming learned. Uh, these behaviors are becoming at npr.org slash smart audio, and there's about four years worth of research there. Uh, but that's just a, a really quick taste of this, and now I think we're going to have a panel, I believe. Thank you. Let's give it up for Tom. All right, EB and our panelists, please come up. All right, we're going to talk about data research. All right. So E.B. Moss is our moderator from Media Village. Let's give it up for E.B. Moss. She's going to introduce our panelists, and we're going to get this conversation going. I feel so far away from you and so close down? to you. Come on down. Come on.
In the first seat to my left is Brett Kinsella. And I'm going to turn to the page because we didn't plan where we were going to sit. Hold on. Cheat sheet's right here. The commentator of the year on voice and AI at the Alexa conference, top 15 in voice according to sound, guest columns in USA Today, and one. Things fast because she is um, named in a list award finalist. And she's been published in Harvard Business Review on voice tech, bias in AI, and multimodal interfaces. I understand most of that, but um, we're going to get into some of that tech talk in a second. My friend Tom Webster. We heard from um, Scott at Google that voice is really about commands and things that you voice do things, right? I come from the world of audio, radio, television. And that's not voice assistance. So we'll start with that. That you can actually do voice navigation on an existing app, for example. And people have seen that for years. And, and that is an area that's going to grow a lot. So I, I, I don't want people just to think this is an assistant world because voice control of applications and these types of things or voice navigation is going to be a bigger thing going forward. And like everybody who's a brand in here should be thinking about that for their properties that require that digital interaction. And then when we get into voice assistance, we have multiple layers of that. So one of the things that uh, Scott was talking about was this command and control with a voice assistant, where the assistant is like the helper in that command and control, so it's not just like walking through a programmatic interface. So that's a really important type of thing. And Google has been out in front of this around being focused on uh, enabling you to be more efficient in what you do, so you spend less time. And so that's, that's a really important a really important thing that the assistants are allowing us to do. You know, I was having a conversation with Brad Abrams last night from Google, and you know, I think his comment is convenience wins. And that's definitely part of, of this activity. And then we have other things where we have utilities, right? So you can ask an assistant to do something for you, which might be like a conversion for, uh, for ounces to grams or something like that. So there's all sorts of different types of utilities that don't necessarily have to be voice apps. 
And then we have media, which you're more familiar with, uh, which is being able to do search of media, pull up media, maybe interact with media, but it's, it tends to be more of this entertainment experience a lot of times. Sometimes it's interactive, sometimes it is uh, you request and then it's more of a broadcast experience. And then we have the other category, which could be lots of things. It could be games, it could be a brand engagement, those types of things. But that's generally how I think about it right now. And over time, I think that other category will form into multiple subcategories, but that's where we start. And uh, Joan, one thing that I left off is your big news of just a few weeks ago, and you're going to add some layers. intrigued by right now? That's what I'm intrigued by right now. Um, well, based in Australia, be shocked if most Huggies and Dominoes, rugby teams, which is kind of the NFL of Australia. Um, but we do really high quality projects for a client. And one of my concepts is I would love to look across our projects and understand what we're learning across different Um, we built it in English and German and uh, French. So I think thinking about different builds, thinking about multi-layers, thinking about how the brand talking to the customer, how it's a fun, potentially gamified experience. We heard about uh, Frozen mm -hmm. 2 earlier today. So I think a lot of, hopefully, little pieces of and the what's compelling about voice. Tom, you're sort of more about the what. And the actually uh, punches well under its very loud American it's a linear vein It all makes a lot of sense. Morning, it's traffic and weather. So they added things to reminder list. Continue to innovate in the industry. Every day, please that people want to in their lives.
Um, building a little bit more into you know the what's in it for the brand aspect of it, I do want to pay homage to your partner in this research, NPR, and um, something that they've worked on actually with Spotify. And we hear a lot about the streaming wars now with OTT, but clearly we're in the kind of war now with with voice and, and audio. So Which is blending in word with, uh, which is for the first time with Jelly Drive. And I know that their digital platform as well. Um, people to use this technology. But, you know, I must, I have all of the devices, because that's kind of my job, um, but I have a, a, I have a Google, never use it. I, 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 will, I will Google it mm -hmm. instead of asking person. I just don't think of it into the world. Interesting. And, and there was a commercial that I saw. Um, woman is uh, speaking into her voice assistant, and she says, um, Buick, warm up my car. And her partner says, you can do that, and the whole theme of the commercial is, you can do that, and I think that that has to be what we need to take away, is how do we educate on, um, you know, where does he get those wonderful toys, what are the cool things that we can do that we're not well communicating to consumers? Brett, how do we tackle that? Well, I think Apple showed us the way when they launched the App Store. There's an app for that. And we need to be able to express that more clearly to consumers. I think right now, part of the challenge has been that there's not an app for that for everything. Mm -hmm. And so there's, in, in voice is a little bit different. And if you're looking at a mobile app and you say, oh, there's an app for that, I can search. And if there's not, then I understand that there's not an app for that. With voice, you don't really know, right? Because it's, 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 it's harder to search. It's not a visual mechanism. Uh, but Advertising like the Buick commercial will help. Uh, we want to see this to be more and more that when consumers go to a voice assistant, whether it's on the phone, in the car, uh, on another device, a smart speaker, we want them to get a, a good answer. And uh, that's, you know, sometimes that's search, um, but a lot of times that needs to be an immersive uh, voice experience. And I tell people who are brands in this room, here's the big problem for you if you're not supporting the space. There's a lot of people, as, as Tom has shown, and other people have shown, that have smart speakers in their home and they're asking them questions every day. There's a lot of people with it on the phone, and if they ask about your brand and you don't respond, you are silent, right? So then you're, it's up to the, to the voice assistant provider to say, oh, answer that question about you or about your category. And that, if you're a brand marketer, I think would be viewed as problematic. And so you need to be in the game so that you actually have the opportunity to serve consumers in this channel that's been growing. You need to actually be like Buick in this case and tell them that it's an opportunity. No one's coming to save you from discoverability. Uh, and I really love the comment that Scott said because a lot of people have not said this in the past, discovery is not a solved problem. Of course, it's really not a solved problem on mobile app, the app store, I think we know that as well. But it's great that Google, who knows more about discovery than anybody else in this market because of what they do, they're saying discovery on voice is not a solved problem, so be aware of that. And uh, when, we, when we think about that, then you as the developer, as the brands, you have an obligation to actually help with discovery of your own thing while the, while the platforms figure out how they can you know, support you as well. Uh, Joan, I'm shilling again for myself now. So when I launched the podcast, 
the ability. <laughs> Thank you.
from the main stage to our breakout sessions to the expo hall. I think we have more than 500 companies speaking at this conference. It has become the place where the global voice first community are coming together. There's just so many affordances that speech give us. It's the first time in my life that my kids are just as excited and up to speed on the tech as my parents, right? This would reduce your balance to about $15,000. That is the experience you want to have when you introduce conversational AI. 2019 sales to date are up 2.1%. How do you use voice and empathy and build that into an experience that's gonna work in a healthcare context? from people who are developing gaming applications, and we learn from that. So the cross-industry pollination, very important and very helpful for us. Coming back one year later and seeing how much this conference has grown, how many more women, frankly, I'm seeing in the space, has been really like impactful to me personally, I think very valuable for Boom as a company to find so many great people to meet and potentially partner with. The talent now better understand what it is that they need to do and how they can participate in this new world of voice first and AI. The world is changing so fast. Voice, like augmented reality, virtual reality, this is gonna be huge. This is the inaugural Voice Summit Awards. This community is innovating at a pace that I don't think any industry has ever seen before. I want us to all give a round of applause for the people in this room that are changing the world. The thing I love most is watching all the connections, all the smiles, seeing all the tweets of people having a great time together. My definition of voice is the ability to empower others. It's time to take this to another level where you and I can make an even bigger impact. To the 5,000 people that came from more than 26 countries, five continents, every state in this union, from me to you, thank you very much. Do you feel in control of your own destiny? Technology drives progress, allowing mankind to make and remake the world for greater authority over our lives. What comes next will make you feel in control of your destiny. And all you need is the voice you already have. Voice is the easiest way to create and monetize content at scale. Your productivity will skyrocket as you get things done at the speed of speech. Voice technology as your new operating system gives you and every other living human great control over your own destiny. Visit attn.live now to create your own connected and abundant future. concern and there, there is going to be a cap on this technology uh, in terms of adoption unless that concern can be dealt with adequately. Well and I think there's privacy in the big data realm but there's also privacy like if I went out in the hallway and was like transaction declined holy shit what happened yeah. I don't need the world to hear that I got my transaction declined like the, the, the different levels of privacy I think we're thinking about and making sure it fits the use case. Right that I'm just buying a hamburger I don't eat meat but if I were buying sure. a, a whatever a milkshake Sure, I don't care how many people hear that, but I think fitting the use case, meeting the user where they're at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and well, you, and, you and I have debated a lot about privacy. I don't know if you want to mention your, your feelings about what users say they do and then what they actually do, I think is a conversation we've had. Yeah, it's sort, of, it's sort of both, but right. Users say they care about privacy, but then I've seen the same thing. I've seen like the people who are most concerned about privacy are only 15% less likely to buy a smart speaker than the people that have no concern about it at all. That's not a big gulf between you know, what they're saying and what they're doing, right? So in general, if the value proposition is strong enough, consumers don't care, right? Because this great arc towards convenience is something that drives them. And I actually think it's really rational on their part. 
because the chances of a problem are actually quite low. Maybe the severity of a problem is high, but the chances are low, and so people are making a trade-off until there's an issue, and then they, they'll adjust their behavior, and so I, I like that. But I really like what Tom said, too. It's not just about adoption of the technology. It might be experimentation with the technology that it is the issue. And maybe that's the bigger issue that we have right now, because you, know, you just presented more than half of the people have tried voice commands. 25% you know, are using them somehow um, daily. Uh, so you know, that's the number that I'm kind of more interested in. It's not like how many people have access to voice and have tried it, but how frequently are they doing it and how broadly are they doing it? So maybe they're not doing transactions. Maybe they're, you know, we just did a report uh, a couple months ago where we saw only 7.5% of consumers have done something related to healthcare with a voice assistant, right? And so that's really low. Now, it's, like, for healthcare, it's like, oh, a lot of room to grow, right? right? But I think that's, I, you know, Tom, I, I really like the way you phrase that. I mean, that put it, puts a, a fine point on it, that if we want broad adoption to all the different things that people in this room are trying to do, then that might be where privacy hurts more than just like overall adoption of being able to do music and timers and some of these other things where people obviously don't care. Well, I, I got the three minute warning about uh, two and a half minutes ago. So um, in the spirit of CES and being in the roaring 20s now and all of the projections, I'm gonna give you each, sorry Pete, I'm gonna give you each 30 seconds max not projections for 2020 with voice, projections for 2025. Ooh, pop quiz. <laughs> Tom. Uh, it, the, the next big, uh, I think, obstacle in the way of voice technology or, or opportunity, I guess, is the car. Um, and I think we're gonna be talking to our cars a lot. Uh, not this year, not next year, but I think you know, 2025 is a good number for that. I, I already do, but usually it's because it's my fault. <laughs> Well, it's gonna, it, we know, uh, just really quickly, we did a study called the Commuter Code where we, we mounted GoPro cameras into cars and aimed them at whatever their entertainment center was, right? Okay. Uh, and we know that people who are listening to digital content in their cars, they switch a lot less yeah. because it's dangerous to do mm -hmm. so because it's generally coming from your phone and you can and will die uh, <laughs> when you do that. Uh, but that's gonna change media consumption in the car. That's gonna change a lot of things. Joan? Productivity. And, and I, I do have to say, I apologize for this, but one thing that I want to mention is your, your women in tech um, founding oh, women in voice, rather. It. You I'm think sorry. I'd leave the stage without mentioning I know, it. and diversity is, is such an important initiative for, for you. There's bias in voice. Media Village has our Advancing Diversity Honors tonight, so I just wanted to pay homage to sure. that, but also give you your 23 seconds <laughs> about 2025 <laughs> projections. Uh, I'm the founder and director of Women in Voice. Uh, gender diversity is super important to all of you uh, for today and the future. So come join us at Women in Voice. We're active on LinkedIn, Twitter, huge international community that I happen to run in addition to my research. Um, productivity tools. I want to stop us writing emails. Um, accessibility. I think there should be so many different ways to interact with content. Multimodal, voice, gesture. This, I, mm -hmm. The number of meetings I'm taking about AR and VR right now is wild. Um, what was the other thing? Accessibility, productivity. I'm, I'm happy with those. Diversity. Yeah. Oh, and, and healthcare. We're talking healthcare, about healthcare right. and wellness. Right. But I think wellness in the broader sense, um, the number of topics about mental health, um, digital detoxing, quality time as related to that productivity tool. If I never have to write another email in my life, <laughs> I'd be thrilled. My mom would be thrilled. My aunt, who has arthritis, will be thrilled. Um, by 2025, we'll see a lot of disruption in that. Yeah, that was an interesting um, presentation at AARP also about voice with the elder community oh and ease of use. And, and they have tons anyway, of There's so much more we could talk about. They have so much money to spend 2025. on it. 2025. Please do it. What are okay. we looking at? Brett Kinsella, ally of women in voice. So, uh, so uh, I think the more interesting thing when we consider predictions is right now what the supply side is going to be do, so, doing. And so I'm thinking about brands. You know, we're at CES. There's a lot of brands here. This is one of those types of tracks. And so I would say by 2025, I'm expecting somewhere around 25% of the top we'll say 500 brands globally, will have their own voice assistant. 
they'll be working on Google, they'll be working on Amazon, they'll be working on Samsung, all these other places because those are channels for them and that's going to be important for them to reach out. But what I think Amazon and Google have proven is that it's really valuable to be able to have that voice assistant as well. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but this idea that you can have your own assistant and you can expand the experience that you offer to consumers is, is a big deal. And I think that that's going to be, over the next couple of years, the a BBC. big trend, yeah. a big trend. I agree. And that, as we say in voice, has to be the last word. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tom. Let's give it up for our panel. That. Thank you, E.B. Thank you, panelists. All right, thank you. Okay, all right, we're just going to keep on rolling here, and we will make up this time, trust me. By the way, two book giveaways to everybody in the room as well. Voice Strategy by Susan and Scott Westwater is going to be given out to all of you. We've got the boxes in the back. At our next break, we're going to make them available, so be sure to grab this book, and then we have another book giveaway after the, after, in the afternoon uh, session as well. Let's give it up for our authors giving up these books for us. Right. Scott and Susan, if you don't know them, you will. They are fantastic, and this book is a wealth of knowledge. Let's bring up our next speaker, our next keynote. All right. So what's fun for me is I started this community 12 years ago with Modev. There was, a, there was an agency out of Charlottesville, Virginia. They were amazing. They started coming to our events early on. But now they are a force to be reckoned with. They just made an acquisition. They're growing and growing. And uh, I look forward to this uh, keynote. Let's give it up for Tobias Dangle, the uh, CEO of Willow Tree. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I know we're behind schedule, um, so we'll try and catch up a little bit. Uh, the format of this is we're going to talk about 15 or 20 minutes about the psychology of voice and what users really want based on our research. Uh, then we're going to have a quick fireside chat with Chris Merrill, who's the chief marketing officer uh, of Synchrony's direct to consumer group. And then we're going to do a panel with some industry experts. But this whole hour is about how large companies uh, and large brands, Fortune 500 types of brands, uh, can think about voice and what's really going on. And what's interesting is we hear all these numbers, right? Voice is the fastest adoption of any technology in history. However, for most Fortune 500 companies, most large brands, it hasn't really changed the way we operate in anything like the internet did, in anything like mobile did. Uh, Willowtree is an agency that builds apps, websites, et cetera, for clients. And we always are getting asked by some of the largest companies in the world, HBO, Fox, Regal Cinemas, Synchrony, our clients, what's next? What's after mobile? And these waves, for whatever reason, happen you know, about every 10 years. And there have been a lot of false starts. If you were at CES six, seven years ago, it was all about 3D TV. If you were here three or four years ago, it was all about AR, VR. None of those have really impacted Fortune 500 brands and their relationship with consumers in any kind of massive way. And the question is why? And so ultimately, it's about what are we solving for the human experience with any technology? And we really believe that voice is the next thing. But we also believe that the reason it hasn't happened yet is we're all thinking about voice the wrong way. Um, and just the topic of voice itself is almost the wrong way to think about it, because really you've got to dissect it into two things. One is humans speaking to machines, and the other is humans listening to what machines are saying. And that all, those are really two completely different things. And voice, the way we think about it, has somehow combined those things in ways that, that I don't think work very well for the human experience. Um, and so, we believe that over the next year, and I think what, what was refreshing to us is Google saying the exact same thing, is that we're going to be moving to a multimodal environment, an environment where uh, the, the app or the website plays a really important role. And what I want to explore today is why that is. So when we, when we as humans start working with a new technology, it's, it's about developing trust and starting to trust that technology. And right now, voice does not have enough consumer trust at the end of the day. We find it very useful for certain things. We find it useful for 
turning on music in our house, for listening to NPR, for very specific things. But in general, for most Fortune 500 kind of companies, it is not at a point where uh, it's useful to them every day. And the question is why. And to understand that, I think you have to understand what builds up trust, right? And as humans, there are two types of trust, emotional trust and cognitive trust. Emotional trust is what we've built up over tens of thousands of years of evolution where we judge each other, usually in less than a second, on whether we trust the person that we have just met, right? Cognitive trust gets built over time. In essence, cognitive trust is pretty simple, is does this human being or does this device do what it says it's going to do, do what they say they're going to do? And I think one of the big mistakes that we have made collectively in voice is with these all-encompassing voice assistants is trying to emulate a human experience and get humans to trust that voice, which is basically impossible at this point. Maybe in 50 years, maybe in 100 years, but right now it's impossible. There's a concept of the uncanny valley that is old. It's, it came about in the 70s vis-a-vis -vis robotics. But the concept was that until you get almost human-like, you actually go through a phase where we as humans trust things less because they're just too weird. Think about zombies, et cetera. And so here's an example of that. Whoa. Can we, this is supposed to, do. all right, it was playing yesterday in the test. All right, anyway, for those of you who know the scene, um, it is a scene of Will Smith interacting with a, you know, a humanoid, and it ends up with Will Smith kind of completely disgusted by the experience because it's just too weird. And so if, if we can't get to that emotional trust, what can we get to? And I think the answer there is we have to hop over and really think about cognitive trust as the primary me mechanism by which we engage voice with voice um, in our devices. And so cognitive trust, again, means does this thing do what it says it's, it does, and does it make my life easier? So why do we like, we got to take a step back, why do we like voice? At the end of the day, it's because it's faster, right? Any, anything that's three times as fast is going to break through in the digital world. We can speak about three times as fast as we can type, and for many of us, over 40, it's typing on a mobile device might be closer to 20 words a minute. The problem right now is that the responses we get from Alexa or voice-only experiences are slower than what we're used to when we read, right? And so when you net those two out, right now, voice isn't solving anything as a standalone service in most cases, right? Voice today is about as fast as or slower than an experience of typing and reading. The breakthrough is going to happen when we speak to machines and we can graphically get responses. And so that's where we kind of get to a real useful world in the voice environment. And so hopefully this one get plays. A cheese pizza with bacon, chicken, mushrooms and olives, a buffalo chicken pizza with onions and peppers, and a veggie pizza with extra cheese. So this is a real demo. We work a lot in the quick serve restaurant space. And on the left, the brand is obviously blinded. We can show that ordering complex, three complex pizzas that we would talk about takes about 10 to 12 seconds. Doing it in the apps, which are, we believe, kind of super user friendly as they are today, it takes closer to 45 seconds. Now what you don't want, you lose all this efficiency if you then have to listen to a voice assistant tell you you have ordered a cheese pizza with bacon, with chicken, because you need a confirmation, right, before you pay. And so that's where voice is breaking down today. It is instead going to move, we're going to transmit voice to our devices, and we're going to get a graphic result back, in most cases, for most kind of Fortune 500 companies in terms of how they interact with consumers. And that's already happening. We do it every day, right? Our natural tendency now is when you have to text someone or write an email on a mobile device, you will dictate it, but you don't want to listen to it. You'll read the result. 
And that is kind of the first phase, the first evolu evolution of this multimodal environment. What's really interesting, I think what's going to happen as part of this is hopping through ecosystems. So what we're working on right now is helping clients engage in an experience, let's say on Alexa, but then hopping to your mobile device that's in an Android or iOS environment and being able to hop across those ecosystems because consumers don't give a crap about those ecosystems, right? They don't give a crap that this is Alexa and my phone is iOS. They want all this stuff to work together. And by using messaging and various authentication approaches, we're able to get there today. Um, in terms of what brands and large companies should be thinking about, and I think Google hit on some of this as well, is what are the three phases of voice? Like, what do you have to do to get good at transmitting information to machines? So first of all, you have to recognize what the human being is saying. The good news is most of us in this room, unless you're Google, Amazon, Microsoft, don't really have to spend a lot of time on that because that, that you know, they're at 95% efficiency, that's on device, that is not any, what anything in this room, anyone in this room has to worry about. What you do have to worry about is what is the meaning of those words, right? So you're going to get words transmitted to you from a device. What do they mean? Scott from Google said today there are three, they have measured 3,000 different ways that just for setting an alarm, right? And this is where I think things get really, really exciting for big companies, is most large companies have the data to train the model today. Usually it's IVR data, um, but they have thousands, millions of interactions with consumers that startups don't have. So what's interesting to us is that this is one of those rare opportunities where established companies with lots and lots of data have a huge advantage over startups that are trying to create this training data from scratch. And so investing in figuring out how to use that data to extract meaning from what humans are asking the device is one important area for investment. The second important area is the UX of response. Right now, you, in the movie example, you've had someone say, "Hey, Regal, what movies are playing tonight?" You've parsed that. You figured out, all right, that means they mean the local theater. That means tonight means 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Here are the eight movies. No one wants to listen to an assistant tell you, "All right, here are the eight movies with three show times each," and then you order a movie. You want to get a visual response. So you get the visual response. How you get that response is this concept of. Um, a user experience, voice-related user experience. Sometimes you will want a voice response. Most of the time, we believe you want a graphic response um, in an app or on a website. And that is where we believe most of the investment should be happening if you're a Fortune 500 company, is figuring out how and under what circumstances we want, um, we want to deliver those responses based on what it is that we're getting the, the user and in what, what situation they're in. We can tell usually if they're driving. We can tell if they're doing X, Y, Z. So getting that right is going to be life or death to these next-gen user experiences. And what we like to think about, and it's funny, I hadn't seen the Google presentation until an hour and a half ago, and when you're going after Google, you're like, well, I hope they're in line with what we're going to say. If they're not, we'll be contrarian, which is cool too. But um, we were pretty psyched that they were talking about this whole concept of enabling your apps with voice, enabling your website with voice. And we think that is the next thing. Now, you might start on a device. You might start on Alexa. You might start in Google Assistant for certain applications. You might start in Siri. But we think most of the interaction over the next two or three years is going to be in the app itself. And how is that going to manifest itself? We think Waze is a good example. right? If you, if you use the Waze app, you see this giant mic button now, they're doing that because we spend a lot of our time driving, but we think those mic buttons are going to be showing up everywhere. Now, they might be overlaid, as Google showed, um, through their OS, or it might be directly in the app. But you get two, three years down the road, we feel that the main way that consumers and employees are going to be interacting with your, with your digital experiences is by transmitting via voice and then receiving information back via text or graphics. And to talk a little bit more about that, um, I'd like to bring up Chris Merrill. Uh, Chris is the chief marketing officer of uh, Synchrony um, Financial, and he's focused on their direct-to-consumer business. Uh, Synchrony, if you don't know, formerly 
part of GE Capital. Um, Chris, for a long time, uh, was the CMO of Synchrony Bank and now has uh, expanded his role to all their direct to consumer. Chris, welcome. Thank you. So, why, to start out, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about what Synchrony's up to in digital generally? Yeah. And then we can talk about the voice. Yeah. Um, so uh, if, you, if you take a step back for one of our new divisions that, that I'm a part of and run um, is direct to consumer and everything about it is digital, right? So we've got a digital bank. Um, so we don't have that national uh, footprint with like a, a brick and mortar as an example. So our only real interaction, especially our first interaction with consumers is digital. So we care a lot about that digital customer experience. Um, whether you're talking about websites, apps, and how it all works together. Um, and that's really our kind of branch in advertising, if you think about it, right? That's our main interaction. We, of course, have call centers, and you can answer anything um, by calling in, but really that first and foremost interaction is digital. So customer experience, the UX that you guys talked about, how consumers can easily navigate and get to the answers or what they need to know, is critically important uh, for us. So what do you think about, how do you think about voice and kind of within the organization, everything that's going on, how does it stack up? Yeah, I, I think voice, I mean, look, voice, uh, you've talked about it, Google talked about it. We all know how important voice is. We can talk 3x as fast as we can type. Um, I love the examples of the movies of, of, we hate listening to voice because it's so slow. I think of that Seinfeld episode where, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kramer was listing out all the movies, and it's, it's very comical to think that's where we are right now. Right. Um, and so that, that clearly doesn't work uh, when you think about um, that, that aspect. But we, voice is a, a part of our lives. We have, you know, over 100 million connected devices at home. Um, you know, over 50% of all Google searches will happen on voice today, this year, versus the typical search. So voice is here to stay. So it's very integral. In my space, in financial services, there's additional complexity that you have with voice um, because of the security concerns. You can imagine um, saying you know, on voice, hey, what's my bank account? How much do I have in my bank account? What bills do I have to pay? Well, wait a second. I don't want you telling this room what's in my bank account and is that secure? So um, you know, those are the, the challenges that I think financial services companies have to work through and other industries as well that have similar um, security or, or risks, but, um, but clearly we like voice and what our approach has been is to really have some basic skills with our app connected right into Google, right into Siri, so that you could say, hey, what's my balance, pay this bill, um, and really kind of get what's the number one, number two, number three things that most people do in my space in banking, it's check your balance. So let's make that really simple and easy and upfront. Yeah, I read some data. I think Bain did a study. Over 50% of banking call center inbound calls are still to check the balance. Yeah. And what's crazy about that is that it's even higher amongst millennials than it is users over 50 because they think it's faster than picking up the app, authenticating, et cetera, et cetera, which kind of goes to our whole point about, about voice. Um, what's hard about voice? What's hard for you to get done um, yeah. What are the challenges for a large organization, especially in the financial services space? Yeah, I, I think there's probably two things that really stand out on voice in financial services. Number one is what we were a little bit, you know, kind of just talking about, which is security. Um, and uh, when you, you know, for us, the way that we've done that, if you're going to pay a bill or you're going to do something that is actually talking about your guys' money in your account, we have an additional step, which is typically you got to put in a four or six digit code to Alexa. So you got to set that up ahead of time. Then you can do, when you talk to Alexa or you talk to Siri, you can say, okay, well, what's your PIN? What's your four digit passcode in order to, uh, to have that transaction? And so the first couple times you actually do that, that again goes back to the speed thing. It takes longer because now I got additional steps, not only every time I want to do it, but the actual initial setup of linking my voice with my PIN code right to, to the app. Um, and, and again, it makes sense on why you have to do that, but we're not quite there where we can actually recognize, oh, this is Chris speaking. I can recognize his voice, therefore I unlock versus someone else. 
Um, so I think that security is a big thing. And, and what we see in the financial services space is over 50% of the people that we have surveyed and, and others have surveyed um, have said that's their number one concern with voice. Is it secure? How do I know that it's not getting hacked? So I think with any new technology, you always run that. Uh, but that's one issue. I think the second thing is the concept that everyone's been talking about today, which is multimodal. Um, and uh, uh, I don't want, especially if I'm in a, any kind of remotely public space, I don't want the voice telling the room what's in my checking balance, how much I owe on my credit card because I had a, too big of a, a Christmas splurge. Um, and so I still want to be able to dictate when I'm driving the car, um, to do something, but I don't want it to be read, read out. So this multimodal, getting it back and saying, okay, you asked for your balance, here it is, the push notification right on your screen. I think that's when really you're gonna start seeing much more um, uh, involvement with voice and really having it all come together. So if you look two, three years down the road, what's, what's the ideal kind of voice relationship between your institution and your end users? Yeah, I think you'd want, yeah, obviously, frictionless, right? We talk about that a lot. But, but you're going to want, you know, I think what's interesting about coming to a place like CES and you see all the different virtual assistants and all the connected devices and how everything can work, um, I, I think it, the world is going to move. And what we want to see, that I, I want to talk to one person and have all the devices connected. I don't want to have to open up eight different apps. I don't want to have to know that I have to say, hey, Google, do this, and then remember, Amazon is Alexa, and Siri is this, and things like that. I want to talk one way, the way that I normally talk, and have all of my accounts interacted so that frictionless is there, and eventually that the system knows that it's Chris speaking. So I don't have to do these multiple steps, and in fact, that's even more secure than um, some of the security challenges that we have today. So I think once we can figure out and have it really so that this virtual assistant voice merges together, you really get rid of the friction um, that still is involved in an early voice. I think that's when you're going to see um, uh, uh, an even more adoption in doing more skills, more transactions. Um, and to the point that we're talking about with, with banking today, it's the same thing with the app. The majority of people come to check your balance. It's that security thing to say, my money's still there. Probably didn't grow that much from yesterday, but at least it's still there, right? And so, uh, but that's the number one thing people do in banking, right? And, and banking in itself is the third most used apps in our wallets, right? You've got social media, obviously that takes the cake. Um, um, weather is second, banking is third. And so, again, I think having that frictionless and using that voice to interact and do my day-to-day -day banking, and when we can really start combining voice with actually helping me solve my day-to-day -day problems, can I afford this, can I do this, that's really when all of a sudden this voice virtual assistant is now someone that you're gonna be going to on a regular basis to help you with your financial decisions. And talk a little bit about the economics, right? It's, it's the consumer value and, and housing for consumer UX is a huge deal. And McKinsey just did a study last year about how important user experience is in any space. We all see it just in our airline apps, right? You, you to some extent, judge an airline by the app, right? right? Um, talk a little bit about, so, so we know that, we've talked about that, but talk a little bit about just the pure dollars and cents if you're able to use voice in an app or in experience versus what happens today if people want a voice experience, they have to call into the IVR. Yeah, I mean, so we, we have, just like most companies you know, of our size have, we've got our own chatbots as well, virtual assistants, um, that basically when you chat or call through an IVR can answer your questions without having actual people behind desks responding to chat, right? And our platform is, uh, is called Sydney. Um, and, and today so far, it's about 18 months old for us, um, over 50% of all inbound calls and inbound chats are answered through this, this effectively uh, virtual assistant. Um, and so as we get smarter, as the world gets smarter, as we start collecting all this data um, and using AI technologies, you think about the cost out, you know, and roughly anywhere from 3 to $5 per phone call, per inbound call, because you've got to staff it, right? You've got to answer all that stuff. 
now I can answer that, and it's faster and more convenient for you as users, that's a double win, right? So it's really easy to have those conversations with our finance team about the payback of something, investing in this technology, investing in UX, when you can start talking about, look at all the calls I'm gonna take out, look at the tens of millions of dollars I'm gonna save from an efficiency perspective, um, it pays for itself very, very quickly. Um, and we've seen that, right? And, and again, you know, you start slow. I like the comments that, that Google and everyone's been saying because you wanna just start, you don't have to say, oh my gosh, I've gotta do 8,000 voice things, I gotta be in every single home device and connect it. Just start with a couple, one or two skill sets, get it in there, start learning, start getting some, um, um, some data back, and then you can really go from there. Yeah, that same Bain study, I think, uh, indicated that it's about a 90% cost savings for financial institutions in general if they can pull, for every call they can pull out of the IVR and put it into a voice assistant. Great. Um, we, we've got about two or three minutes, so I'm going to go a little off script. Does anyone have any questions for Chris? Uh, before we go into the full panel here. Yes. Check one, two. Uh, I mean, you touched on it very briefly, but uh, about uh, individual user accounts. So I can, I have my own interaction with my, my assistant and my wife has her set of accounts. Sure. How, how close are we to that, do you think? So that, that, that so, so that the assistant can recognize who it is that's talking and address those security issues. <laughs> I'm probably the that. wrong person to uh, answer Thank that. You. Maybe to be as you can help. I, I think we're still a ways away. There are there are companies like um, we've done some investments in companies like Pin Drop um, that can uh, recognize your voice. I think like anything else, um, we're using that as like add-on services, not the main uh, aspect that says this is more secure than giving me your four-digit code that we're so accustomed, or my uh, thumbprint or, or facial recognition. Um, um, so there, there are definitely companies out there that are doing that, and I'm sure we're probably closer to having that technology that can really do that. How quick companies and financial services are to just jump in with that probably is uh, a, a, obviously a little bit more of a lag, especially when you're talking about your money. Um, and your security, so you'll probably see things like that in non-banking first, would be my guess, but I don't know, to be as if you've Yeah, got... I mean, we, we see that. The authentication piece, especially when you hop across ecosystems, gets pretty complex, right? It's really easy for us to be up here and say, hey, ask Alexa what movies are playing tonight and get a notification, but what happens in the background is pretty complex because your Amazon authentication has to be tied now into your Regal Cinemas authentication, that's doable, but that's another step the end consumer has to go through. Um, and that's obviously a, a, an application where security is not quite as much of a concern as, as it is when it comes to your bank account. Yeah. All right, thank you, Chris. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. you all. Thank you, Chris. We'll now pull up and the panel. Tobias, yeah, you're going to stay right there. We're going to bring up uh, Ben Rubin. Ben, haven't seen you yet today. Hi, nice to see you. Come on up. Thanks. Ben's going to moderate our next panel. Panelists, please come up. Nice to see everybody. Nice hey, to see you. how's it going, man? Nice to see you, sir. Nice to hey, see you. how's oh, everybody good. doing? All right. Great job. All right. Okay. <laughs> We've got everybody here. I'm going to get started while we're all sitting down. I'm Ben Fox Rubin. I'm a senior reporter for CNET. I've been covering voice computing for the past four years, watching the market explode from a niche echo speaker that first nobody really cared about to now providing a daily companion for millions of people. At our panel, in our panel today, we've got a bunch of really brilliant people who approach voice from a variety of fields. Uh, today, I'm hoping to discuss privacy needs, especially for medical and financial information, using voice for accessibility, and the future prospects of voice. Uh, these are our panelists. Joel Zuckerman, who runs the Emerging Platforms Group for NPR. Dr. Sanja Pruthi, a primary care doctor at Mayo Clinic and the chief medical editor for MayoClinic.org. David Hayfitz, a technology vice president for Prudential Financial who oversees mobile and web applications for the company's employees. Paul Williams, general manager of product management and growth at GE Lighting. And Tobias, who I think you guys already know. Should I introduce you again? General man, oh, sorry. CEO and co-founder of Willow Trade. So Joel, I want to start with you first. 
um, at NPR, what, what, where do you see the intersection with NPR and voice? Where are you taking what you do at NPR in different new directions? Well, the amazing thing uh, several years ago with the introduction of the first uh, Echo device was almost overnight, there were millions of new radios in people's homes. And so for us, we saw it as an immediate opportunity to reach new people in new ways and reach uh, existing listeners in new ways at a time where uh, you know, many people under the age of, let's say, 30, 35 may have never had a radio except the one in their car, and if they lived in an urban area, maybe not even having a car. Uh, it was an immediate way to reach people with our content. So that sort of phase one from NPR was just make our content, live streams, podcasts, uh, newscasts, uh, available in as easy a manner as possible with very, very clear, easy to use utterances. And so from that first um, product video on uh, Amazon.com when they introduced it, it was, hi, I'm Lakshmi Singh, this is uh, uh, news from NPR. <laughs> and so from there, uh, we say, okay, well, that, that's phase one. What's, what's next? And for us, what's next is uh, finding new ways for continuous listening. So if you listen to the newscast, finding ways to get you to listen a little bit longer, a little bit more. Uh, and some of that might be personalized through NPR One uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, bringing in podcasts. And then from there, it's, okay, what are these devices really good for? And what's important about the context in which you're using the devices, whether it's in the car, whether it's in your home, and how might you interact differently? So we, we built uh, with uh, a partnership with our friends from VaynerSmart, the wait, wait, don't tell me quiz, <laughs> wait, wait quiz. And so there, uh, Peter Sagel and, and Bill Curtis, the hosts of the show, actually ask questions and you can play along at home, the same as the popular uh, Saturday radio show that, that NPR has produced. So, so that's sort of moving into more, okay, what, what might people want to do with these devices? Uh, and from there, now it's a, it's a matter of uh, thinking about how people might be able to d uh, dive more deeply into content of their choosing into a 40, 50 year archive of NPR content. So we're thinking a lot about that. So um, in related to that, as far as new usages, Dr. Pruthi, um, I think it's very interesting one of the elements that you're looking at for voice, which is bringing voice into emergency room settings. So why, why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you, um, Ben. We. Um, We've invested and optimized our health information um, library, not only in print and web and taking it to smartphones and, and now um, in voice. And we really wanted to look at how can voice technology improve the value and um, efficiency in a clinical setting. And um, more importantly is how can you bring voice technology to the consumer at their choice of their channel and the device in which they want to receive that health information when they need it and what they're looking for. And so what Ben is alluding to was an, an opportunity at Mayo to look at how we could deploy a smart speaker in an emergency room in a, in a pilot setting where it's just starting to, to understand can the smart speaker in an ER setting um, for example, provide health information to address questions that the patient or their family are, are thinking about. And, and the example that we're studying right now is chest pain. And um, what they want to do is have the smart speaker be available to answer questions that you might be sitting there thinking about while you're waiting for your next appointment in the ER or being triaged to a department to do additional testing is what is a treadmill? And the smart speaker provides that educational content or what are troponins? Um, why am I getting a, what is 24 hour observation? And just think about how that could improve um, the efficiency from the clinician, the ER docs perspective, not having to do all that where the smart speaker can provide that educational at a timely way to meet the needs of the patient. But then even at the other side is the nursing staff are hearing the conversations that are, the questions that are being asked. And if there is a question that um, the, cons the patient is asking of the smart speaker, well, um, you know, my pain is getting worse or there are symptoms that are changing, that would be a, a triage to get into that room and, and then um, address that needs of, those patient, of that patient at that time. Well, so, so it's what, kind of an exciting area to study. So one, one interesting element of that or one potentially problematic area of that would be, wouldn't that open you up to possible litigation that you're providing 
perhaps medical advice or even something that comes close to medical advice, especially right. in an emergency room setting. Right. So I'm, I'm curious what your response is right. there. And, and um, that's a great question. Um, at this point, what I've just described is actually more general knowledge. We're providing health information. We're not personalizing it yet to their individual health um, condition at the at the way in which the pilot was designed. So we're not concerned at this point regarding the privacy issues, but eventually, if we were to take it to the next level where we're, we're addressing their specific healthcare needs, not just general knowledge, then we would wanna be looking at how to address the privacy. So looking at it a little bit more broadly as far as privacy concerns, Tobias, I'd love to uh, have you jump in here too to talk about um, you know, for, for what you do at your agency. How, how do you address some of those privacy concerns, especially as voice starts to migrate and move into more you know, medical, as Dr. Pruthi was talking about, also financial, uh, a handful of other obviously more private issues or, or more sensitive types of data? Yeah, I mean, I think multimodal plays a huge role. In, in a lot of these examples, the patient is going to want to engage via voice, but they're often going to want to get the information via a graphic or text interface, and they've got the phone with them. So then the trick becomes, how do you move, how do you know, all right, this human being is the one that asked the question, you move that authentication back and forth, but we believe that the, the, the multimodal just solves so many problems. It solves the speed problem, which is a huge problem um, in, in the case of information, but it also solves a big part of the privacy problem um, and, and, and a security problem as well. And so that, in a lot of use cases, is where this is going to end up. The, the medical field is just so fraught with opportunity. And one of the things we look at, we work with a lot of hospital systems, is just the amount of time or the number of times that the same data gets re-entered. Anyone who's spent time in, a, in, in the medical system knows this. How many times you get asked the same question? How many times it gets repeated? How many times it hops? That same information has to hop along the way. And that information is out there because it was spoken often. If we can pick that stuff up, enter it into the system, but again, it goes to speaking, not receiving information so much via voice. I'd love to hear from some, some other folks on the panel, too, about that specifically related to privacy and also you know, much more sensitive information as we you know, bring voice into more areas. You know, from a financial services perspective, uh, you know, we sell a promise. We don't sell you a tangible thing that you can hold on to, and that promise is built on technology and data. And uh, you know, you're, you're trusting us in a, as, as we pr produce financial wellness solutions that we're going to give you back something that you gave to us at a much greater multiple. So uh, people don't think of it, but we have to be, voice is just another data platform. It's just another source, which means we have to protect it like we would anything else. So you, know, you have to understand that security has to be at that same level. I have an obligation and prudential to make sure that your data is secure point and simple, no matter how you give it to me. It could be a, it could be a written check if it's on paper, but I have to, I have to, I have to secure and, and, and make sure I'm, I'm um, providing you all with all the peace of mind on, on how that paper, what we do with that paper, as well as what we do with how your voice is captured or the data that you give to us via web or mobile or other interface. So I think it's about um, thinking at voice that you have to be platform agnostic. I guess it's multimodal. It's not about, there's no special treatment for voice. It has to be equal treatment to make sure that you're providing that exact same level of security regardless of how you, where, you're, where it's coming from, what kind of, where you're collecting that data from. Paul, I'd love to get you to jump in on this too. Yeah, but, uh, voice is a big part of the smart home, and with that comes the privacy concerns around what's happening with that data. When my lights turn on, when I turn them on, when I lock the door, um, can I detect if someone's not home and make it a great opportunity for someone to come to my house when no one's home? Um, and so protecting that data is very critical to us, and it's one of the things that we hold as one of the cornerstones of what we're building in the smart home. Uh, to be able to protect consumers from that, we want to make sure to, first of all, educate them. There are some things you give away when you, when you uh, put a voice speaker into your home. There are some things that are going to get collected that you may not want to have collected. Some of those you can opt out of, some of them you can't. And we want to make sure we educate the consumers on that. What we're doing with the data we're collecting to make the home smarter so that we're suggesting through AI things that can happen in the home, that's all owned by the consumer. That's a big part of what we stand on. The consumer owns that data. If they want to, that data to exist there to improve their lifestyle in their home, in the smart home, then it's there. If they opt out of that, they don't get that benefit, but they get the other benefits that go along with, with uh, smart home. And we think taking that approach of letting consumers make the decision, but educating them about what the advantages, disadvantages, and also the uh, risks are with those is a very important part of that communication with consumers. Yeah. Uh, 
David, you're looking into using voice from an accessibility perspective. So I want to introduce that into the conversation too. Tell us about what you're doing at Prudential. Yeah, just similar to what I said that people think of voice as something separately. I mean, voice is a great gateway and a great tool to make the workplace accessible to all. So like I said, I'd like to say earlier, we provide financial well wellness solutions for everyone, but in order to do that, we need to have a workplace that's accessible to all. And uh, we're le leveraging technologies like Ava, which will do live captioning for interaction with our low, uh, our, um, our deaf or hard of hearing employees, that they should be able to walk in seamlessly to any meeting, any situation, any, any professional setting in Prudential and be able to contribute and uh, participate in the level as anyone else. Same for our blind employees with, with technologies like Ira. So voice can be used in ways that you maybe not wouldn't think of. People I, I often get uh, confronted with, Voice for deaf employees, explain that to me. But it gives, it gives them the ability to text in a voice and participate in the conference, and it gives us to, so, so we can hear their voice, and it gives them a chance to follow along, and it's great for all employees to be able to see uh, the captioning and what's happening. And, and, and when uh, you have a workplace that's accessible to all, you will be through, you know, the, the, the data shows that having an inclusive workplace makes you much more productive and, and much more in, in what you, when you do something that's, when you do something that's good, you also do something well, you, you also will perform well in the, in the market. So I really believe that doing good is doing well. well. What's the response been so far from employees? I mean, like, how much have you actually implemented some of this stuff? And, you know, in those early efforts, what have you heard from employees about it? I, I will say it's early efforts, but uh, we're very excited. Uh, you know, we, um, you know, in, in my team, we have Thomas Chapel who came to us from the National Technical Institute of the Deaf. And so we're partnering with them to find out how we can get more of their students in. We, um, Thomas uh, was, uh, closed out the voice conference in July in Newark as a, as a deaf employee. So you had a deaf developer closing out a voice conference. So I think the, you know, it's not, again, just for the people who are consuming it. It's not just for our deaf and low, vi low vision employees. It's for all employees to realize whatever that challenge you're bringing, whatever that circumstance you have, whether it be a physical or other type of disability, you should be able to contribute and you should be able to be recognized on the level of anyone else. And I think it's important when an, an enterprise like Prudential takes that, uh, again, we're, pro we're producing financial wellness solutions for everyone. So for us to take that mantle and have it followed or even, to, you know, not followed, but at the same pace by companies like GE, by company institutions like NPR, that's the Mayo Clinic. It's, we're all in this together and, and, and uh, you know, all, all ships rise. Yeah, Paul, you also uh, do some work around accessibility as well, is that right? Yeah, we do. So one of the things that uh, we're working through is, is making sure that if there is an issue with somebody being able to have accessibility to lighting control, thermostat control, that by providing that infrastructure so that they can use voice to enable those, those features uh, where they may not be able to get to them quickly and easily, but also extends into elder care as well and, and aging in place, uh, which is, is certainly becoming a, a hot topic today as we have this elderly population wanting to, and being healthy enough, thanks to Mayo Clinic and others, healthy enough to live in those places longer. Uh, it's usually the, their caretakers that are more concerned about them than they are living in the home. And being able to figure out a program that allows that information to be shared, but shared in a way that allows that person to have a private environment but also their loved ones and caretakers to know that that person's up and doing well right. today. They've been up, they've, they've at least opened the refrigerator today. They may not have eaten, but opening the refrigerator is a good sign that they have at least tried to. Um, and there's some things we can do without having to have somebody try to call them their caretaker, either drop by 20 times a day or try to call them 20 times a day. So keeping that, that very personalized and private environment is very important. That extends into voice. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that we're seeing this, this population, certainly from what we see, um, is that, uh, and I'll use my mother-in-law as a great example, 82 years old, never thought she was gonna be able to pick up the voice thing. We put a voice assistant in place, she doesn't stop using it all day long. <laughs> and it's, it's become this great friend for her in place to get information, to share stuff, to get things to happening. And, and that allows that accessibility to these other features that she may not have had because her mobility is limited within her space today. And, and to, I mean, to, to build on that, just a great example. Aging in place is a critical strategy for Prudential in some of our business areas. It's something we're building on. We want people to stay in their homes as opposed to going, being in the hospital. So working with people, with organizations like the Mayo Clinic and GE, you wouldn't maybe connect Prudential, a financial services enterprise with a healthcare provider and a you know, consumer goods, electro, you know, electronics or, or, uh, a conglomerate like GE, but they're, they're critically aligned. We want to, and, and another uh, interesting factor that people oversee sometimes is they often say, yeah, but 
voices from millennials, and I'm sure you'll, you'll say this because you know this from your agency work, it's, what, what do you, but other people aren't adopting it, and we're actually seeing the reverse. Senior citizen and older populations are the ones who are coming in and be faster adopters because it makes a life-changing difference for them. If we can prevent a fall, falls are the leading cause of, of I believe, death, but also you know, of, of um, hip, hip replacement. Yeah, disability. <laughs> Uh, in senior citizens. If we can reduce that because we can turn on the lights at night, we can, we can find, we can call for help, you're doing great things. So again, accessibility, it ties right back in to uh, what it means for health, for financial wellness, for security, for fi it's great. Dr. Prezi, do you have something to add with this too? I feel like it's very related yeah, no, to what I, I mean, you it's do. It's great. You guys yeah. are all doctors. This is really great. <laughs> <laughs> um, what what I, I think is important is, again, how do you get that um, health information to when they need it? And for many of them, it's in their home. And um, we were fortunate to work with Amazon to um, deploy 8,000 um, conditions, symptoms, and procedures so that um, the uh, consumer could, using their um, Amazon Alexa device and, and now on Google Assistant, um, getting health information when they needed it. And um, uh, Ben ha also uh, had heard me talking about not just around just general health knowledge, but we also built out a first aid skill so that um, common everyday scenarios where one could n need a first aid um, treatment plan or self-service or how do you take their self uh, manage how do you treat uh, a, a specific uh, scenario, the a skill could be deployed mm -hmm. in the kitchen or at home. And, and I think that we're going to see more opportunity to use voice in these um, uh, home settings where they can make decisions about triage or when do I seek urgent or emergent care. Can you, can you give people um, some examples of what types of things people would ask about sure. that? Um, know, so from a first aid perspective, yeah, that's pretty broad. From a first way, the one that's the most typical, you know, you're, you're in the kitchen and you may have developed, had a burn from just touching the oven um, and they are going to uh, ask Amazon Alexa at that time, I've just um, had a burn, what do I do? Or another common one is um, if they have um, a, working with a knife and they're cutting vegetables and they, they get a cut and they want to know what do I do to manage this. These are things that um, Amazon Alexa can answer. We, and the work we did was to create it so that they could get in a conversational um, design of the content in a short, concise message. Remember, nobody wants to read a paragraph that they would get on. Well, they're reading on especially <laughs> paragraphs. <laughs> when I'm, I'm it's just a good effort. example of like why you wouldn't want to use a touch screen in you that particular example. You wouldn't want example. to, so you would just say, what do I, what would I do next? And um, so that was a, a lot of um, ed, ed, editorial training that we did at Mayo where our staff um, learned how to write this, con take this content from the web and um, uh, deploy it onto a smart speaker. I mean, I just want the one other point I want to add is again, in not people not considering where the future of voice is, cutting edge technology, and I don't, and you can speak to this much better than I. We might be able to ana use voice analysis to check health yeah. just by the we, text context. You know, if a senior citizen's voice changes, I, and I don't, I don't know if that's yeah, where that is, is yet. It is. I do know we, that we use the gate, so we use a platform called Evo to look again. It's it's platform agnostic, but it collects data, so it can see that a se someone who's walking a little slower or their gait has changed might be get coming down with a health condition. And I'm sure that in the near well, future, we'll see it in, in voice alone. There, there has been work done in that area. And um, at Mayo, we actually did look at voice as a diagnostic, diagnostic. biomarker um, in coronary artery disease. And they actually looked at the voice utterances, the frequency and the intensity of voice, and assessed it in 138 patients who were having coronary angiograms and actually found a correlation between those who had voice changes and um, predicting that they had had coronary artery disease. Now imagine at care at a distance how you could have been able to use voice um, to um, manage patient care needs and triage appropriately. Well, I, I am curious though, this goes back to our conversation about privacy as far as, do you think this is something that customers will accept? Is it something that their caregivers will accept? As far as, it, it, it sounds potentially a little bit more invasive than just asking it, for the It web. might be, but is, is it, would you rather have a heart attack or would you rather have, get some help right away? 
it's an interesting right. point. Right, I mean invasive, but would you rather have invasive surgery or would you rather have invasive in your home through your voice? I, I, I'm not, I don't mean to belittle the issue. It's no, not at all. It's, it's, it's critical, but it's you a have to, for me to ask the question. I, you I have think to balance. That, <laughs> I think the uptake amongst um, consumers is going to be higher as they learn what it could do to help prevent or early detect disease. Um, in the case of high blood pressure is another area where voice could be used as a biomarker um, or impending stroke or somebody's at risk of a stroke. All this work is already being done. And I think that when consumers know that you're using it to help understand if I may be um, at risk of some um, uh, uh, illness that requires urgent or emergent care, you're going to want to share your data and it'll again be part of the privacy and the two-factor authentication. What else are we going to do to make sure it's the right patient who's asking the questions is getting the care that, that the, they need? And I think, Ben, the, for consumers it's always who has the data and mm -hmm. it goes back to the trust question. How much trust do you have in that brand? I think most people in this room would say we all have a lot of trust in the Mayo Clinic brand and we know that they're gonna use this data for good. If, no offense to anyone from there, but if Cambridge Analytics were getting the data, <laughs> you might not feel the same way about it. And I think that's where it all comes back to this trust thing of who has the data. And I think not only consumers aren't informed, the technology isn't really clear as who has what data. If some of this information is being transmitted through Alexa, does Amazon have the data or not have the data? And I think one of the things we as an industry owe the consumer is yeah. who has this data, for how long, et cetera, and consumers are going to say, if, if Mayo Clinic has this stuff, that's cool. If Amazon has it, I don't but, know if that's cool. If Cambridge has it, probably not cool. But we'll Im imagine the, the penultimate situation where you're using the NPR app for wait, wait, don't tell me. And that's able to sense a change in your voice that would, t would send that, mm -hmm. would ask you, do you want to contact a, uh, you know, a health <laughs> provider? That's, that's a, kind of a crazy scenario, but you know, it's not likely that every consumer is going to have the Mayo Clinic credential, or you don't know where they're going to be coming in from. So if you can achieve that trust, and it might be that it's a trust that's secured through consumer, an, independent, an independent entity, not the brand individually, because that would be fantastic, because I care about that consumer. I don't care how they got to me. So if I can get, if, if NBR can help us reach a consumer as easily as the Prudential app or the Mayo Clinic app or the VF, that's great. I, mean, I think as we, as we talk about the, the sort of overarching view of this panel, I, I think, you know, trust does, it does come down to trust. And I think we, we heard uh, earlier about the discoverability problems and you can create the, the, the greatest uh, action on Google or uh, uh, Alexa skill in the world, but if people can't find it, if people yes. don't, know that you might be in that business, it, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't do anybody any good. And so as, uh, as brands, I think it's our responsibility to uh, whatever uh, the, uh, the situation is, whether it's in the operating room or, or your home or uh, you know, IOT, or just simply trying to create great civic discourse yes. in our world, being able to trust that, uh, that, that if, you're in an authenticated state on an NPR uh, platform and you're listening to stories on demand and they happen to be about a particular topic, then NPR is not going to say, hmm, I see that <laughs> you're listening to a lot of stories about diabetes and mm -hmm. maybe now I should bring in advertisers that, uh, uh, that, that create diabetes drugs. And, and so the respect for the, uh, the, the consumer, the listener on whatever platform I think is really going to be continually uh, critical in, yeah. in the space. So we're, we're talking a lot about medical. I want to broaden the conversation a little bit with you know, a little bit of time that we do have left. Um, where, where do you all see voice going in 2020 and beyond? You know, kind of what's your big think here? What would you really hope to see pretty expansively? I want to start with Tobias. Hopefully we get through everybody. But. Yeah, so I think two things. One is I think voice as a concept is going to migrate away from being a voice-only experience to being just a part of our multimodal digital ecosystem and a lot of the voice is going to be right in the apps now it might be it might start with Alexa it might start with Siri it might start with Google Assistant um, but it's going to be in that it's just going to be part of digital and going to get used to getting a response digitally from voice um, I think that's a big piece of it and one thing we have not talked about a lot is I think voice is going to hit the workplace in a giant way and maybe even faster than the consumer side of it if you just think about all the time, all of us and all of the folks at our all the folks at our company spend entering information on a keyboard, whether it's answering email, whether it's data entry, X, Y, Z, 
If all that can be done uh, in about a third of the time, um, what productivity benefits that has? And I think a lot of companies are starting to look at that. And that might be actually the fastest adoption of voice. And it's going to fundamentally change the workplace because if you and I are both talking to our machines all day, we can't be sitting in an open office environment two feet apart the way we are today. So it has a lot of downstream ramifications. But I think that's a really interesting place that, that we should all be thinking about voice as well. David? You know, what, what I'm excited about and in, in why I do the job I do is, you know, to build on what you're saying, if you can design for the employee in a regulated firm like ours, then going to consumer is that much easier because that's the burden. I have, if I told, talked about earlier about securing that promise, the data I have to secure internally is that much more challenging than externally. And, and we, I'm sure you, you, you can yeah. go into that in great detail. So um, my hope and dream, and I don't think it's really that long term of a dream, if I say what's in 2020, is, is using voice technology to make the workplace accessible to all. If we can band together that you can use your voice as equally as anything else, whether you have a physical voice or not, and we can leverage these technologies for good, uh, and, I, and I think that is in the forefront as we see, see adoption grow dramatically, and we can, and you said earlier about the, we can create an ecosystem of, co of collaboration amongst, you know, uh, amongst um, brands and organizations in a, in a trusted manner, that is, uh, that, will, that will change the world in which we live. Yeah. Joel? I would say four years ago, it was all about the smart speaker, right? Over the last two years here at CES, it's about integrations of uh, voice interactivity into every device you can possibly imagine. Google showing Instapot integrations uh, <laughs> at its, uh, uh, its experience. So uh, I, I think going forward, it's already lost sort of the novelty of just being able to talk to a machine and have it respond, a simple response and, and answer call. I, I think there's going to be a much more move towards conversational uh, uh, interaction and voice interaction meets AI uh, to allow you to perform more and more uh, tasks that help you. But in order to do that, again, it is, it is going to be one surface among many surfaces that we use to help our lives to make them, make them better. Touch is still super important. The multimodal uh, that, uh, that, that Google and Amazon and, and Samsung are, are thinking so much about, uh, I, I think it's going to come down to the context with which you're in, what tasks need to be done, and whole new businesses are going to continue to spring from it, as, as we see here. Yeah. So I, I would agree with previous speakers that uh, you know, multimodal also having the ability to have this integrated experience so that it's not just I'm going to the speaker that I, I do this function and speech becomes a part of that or voice becomes a part of that, and then I move to the next thing. That's going to continue to, to propagate. Um, I'm, I'm confident consumers are going to start making the decision. We all did with cell phones. Your cell phone knows where you're at at any given time and point in the planet. Um, there's risk versus reward, and people are going to have to make those decisions. It's important for us, as we've talked about, our, as, as manufacturers and as brands, to make sure we're communicating with consumers about what those risks and rewards are. Um, but I'm confident it's going to continue to, to expand within our space, and specifically in the home automation space and smart home space that I'm integrated part of. It's a big part of that. It's a big part of, of what we're doing. But what I'm most excited about, really honestly, is the aging in place. Um, and we mentioned it earlier, I talked about it, it's something I'm passionate about because we've got this population that even if they wanted to, because of availability of those other resources, they're not going to have it. They're going to be forced to stay in place. And what we want to do is make sure that they're safe. Uh, that the people around them feel safe and secure. But we also want them to be private and to be able to live in a private world. So, right. Dr. And, and I'll just wrap up. I think where I see the future is the intelligent voice interface will have to get around contextual knowledge, know when the consumer is addressing a mistake or there may be issues that need to be resolved. It has to have that conversational design to be able to be empathic to the user, and I think that's where artificial intelligence and machine learning can do that. Um, anxiety or dealing with somebody who's um, dealing with medical issues where you want them to remember what you had asked the speaker a week ago and be able to ask you along the way, what should we be doing next? So I think that is the future where I would love to see voice um, be able to um, change the way in which it could be used across the patient's entire healthcare journey, not only prior to coming to see a doctor, um, during the clinical visit, when they could help with the clerical burden in the office for the provider and the patient, 
and then when they go home to give discharge instructions, medication compliance, reminders about what they need to do about their health condition. I think there are so much opportunities where voice could be used across the entire healthcare spectrum. Great. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being on the panel. I, I hope uh, you guys in the audience got uh, something out of it. And uh, I, think, I think that's it. We're going to wrap up. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Let's give it up. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, panelists. Wear these, wear these, wear these, wear these with pride. There you go, and the, and the socks, please. Thanks so much. Oh, socks. Socks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so you too. Thanks so much. Ben, thank you, man. Yeah, it's we great. Weaved all that, <laughs> <laughs> we all that together well. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. You got the socks, man. You're in. And the visor. And the visor. All right. Let's see here. Where did I set that thing? Where did I set that device? Just a second here. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. So we're going to bring up our next speaker uh, with Google, Barris. Excuse me. Excuse me. Barris Goltekin. And um, we're really excited about this because not only is Barris going to take us on another journey in voice, uh, they're going to also then feature a case study with American Express that we're really excited about as well. Um, so did I mention Google? This is amazing. Here is a beautiful Google Home Hub in my hand, the multimodal device, and each one of you is getting this device. Let's give it up for Google. <laughs> After Barris' keynote and the, and the case study, we will have these devices in the back of the room, along with the voice strategy books we talked about earlier. So load up. and. Um, Thank you again. Barris, looking forward to your, to your talk. Take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Barris did tell me he was plugging in up here, so I was supposed to take a little time, and I, <laughs> in the interest of expediency, I didn't. Everybody having a good time? Let's give it up for these speakers. That's not the, the, density, the density of knowledge in this space, in this room, is just unbelievable. I mean, when you think about what's happened over the last five years, yes. you can almost distill it down to what we're, con what we're talking about here today. So many backgrounds, so many experts, people that have tried and failed and tried again and succeeded. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I can't even, I see so many familiar faces, but I see a lot of new faces as well uh, from around the world. James, come in from London uh, with RB. Great to see you. Um, and uh, we're going to end up this session. We're going to catch up on a little bit of time. So we'll have about a 45-minute lunch break. So an opportunity to get to know each other, to chat, and get your devices. And please meet our sponsors in the back of the room as well. They have amazing stories to tell. How are we doing on AV? We getting there? Oh, we're going to try this one. Here we go. Oh, we got a, uh, OK, we got a dongle, dongle issue. So anybody in the live event space knows that it all comes down to the dongle. Um, my life has been tormented by dongles for the last 12 years. So uh, anyway, but getting better all the time. All right, so another reminder. We have our reception tonight. How many are familiar with our voice reception tonight? OK, here's the deal. We have an amazing voice industry reception happening at the Park MGM. It's about a 12 to 15 minute walk from here. You can stay inside. It's at the Juniper Lounge. I know we're in the oh, Juniper just, Room, just but this case. is at the Juniper Lounge. It's a, it's a beautiful speakeasy at the Park MGM. And we have food. So there's food, open bar for two hours. It's where the voice industry at CES will be networking. You can please RSVP if you're going to be going to that. You can RSVP yeah. off the website voicesummit.ai slash CES. 
Um, so please RSVP and come meet us there. I know that we're approaching capacity, so um, definitely get your name on the list to come over and join us at the Juniper Lounge. Hashtags for today, if you want to follow us on social, uh, hashtag voice2020. Uh, and also we're coupling that up with the, with the hashtag CES2020 uh, in all of our social. How are we doing? Getting closer? He's restarting. Oh, we'll okay, try. we're rebooting. All right. A um, couple other announcements. Voice, uh, Voice Summit, how many have been to Voice so Summit the, the last couple of years up in, that we had in New Jersey? All right, so we're in our third year for that conference. We're gonna have more than 5,000 people coming to Washington, D.C., October 5th through 8th. We're opening registration today. Uh, and uh, we will also be circulating a, a discount code for the people that attended this event uh, to get the main stage and expo pass at that event. Uh, but there's also other passes available. So anyway, Voice 2020, just go to voicesummit.ai. Looks like we are live. We are live. All right, Barris, take us away. Thank you. All right. Let's give it up for Barris. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Barris. Um, I lead the product management for the Google Assistant on mobile. Uh, and I'm really, really excited to be here because I believe we're at the cusp of a very interesting you know, next big platform. Voice is emerging as the next big platform, and we're seeing a lot of engagement, both from our users as well as from our partners. You know, with our partners, we're seeing new titles emerge, like uh, you know, head of uh, conversational design or director of voice. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is you know, the role that mobile assistant can play in getting us through this next uh, uh, new big platform. So mobile is a very exciting space, right? Uh, Google Assistant is on more than one billion devices. And yesterday, uh, Google also announced that we have uh, more than half a billion users interacting with the assistant on a monthly basis. And it's uh, no secret that the majority of those devices are also, uh, also mobile. At the same time, we have a big challenge. You know, unlike speakers, uh, where Google Assistant is the way to get things done, like uh, you know, playing music or setting timers, on a mobile device, we have applications. And users really like and use these applications on a regular basis. That is the way to get things done on mobile. So the question is, what role can a mobile assistant play on a mobile device, and why should we care? I believe the answer here is because we're at the cusp of the next paradigm shift. So if you look back in history, every single time there was a substantial shift in how natural input becomes and output becomes, there was a big paradigm shift. So think about going from a command line interface back in the day to graphical user interfaces. Going from our Blackberries to multi-touch on uh, modern displays, uh, modern smartphones. In both of those cases, input became a lot more natural. And with voice and with natural language understanding, I believe we're at the cusp of the next paradigm shift because everything becomes a lot more natural. When I see my little two-year-old interact with Google Assistant, one of his first words were, hey, Gogo. -go. And it was super exciting to see that I can see you know, this natural interaction uh, you know, taking place. So when we think about mobile, uh, of course, users are on their devices on a regular basis interacting with applications. So the role that Google Assistant can play here is a big question. If you think about how you use your phone, let's say you want to order coffee, you need to go find the Starbucks app. Then you need to go into the section of the Starbucks app that, the, that is about orders and click on reorder. You know, we do this without thinking much about it, but there's multiple steps involved uh, to get us there. It's a very procedural way of doing things. And we believe with natural language understanding, with voice, we can move from a procedural way of doing things to an outcome-based computing, where all you need to say is, I want coffee, and have all the services that are ready on your device to come and help you get things done. So Google Assistant can play that brokering role, uh, connecting what the user needs with all the different services they have access to. In October this year, we announced uh, and launched this new product, uh, a new version of the Google Assistant uh, that we call the new Google Assistant. What we've done is we've rethought how an assistant on a mobile device can operate. Rather than having it be a destination that you go to, we think about the assistant as a core thing that is deeply built into your phone that can allow you to interact with your phone while you're using your applications. 
It's not a destination that you go to, but it's always with you. So that means it's integrated into your phone. It embraces applications that users use on a regular basis and allows the users to interact with these applications. Um, it also takes into account how it can be helpful. Rather than uh, you know, just one-off direct interactions, it, it, it allows the users to connect through journeys, uh, horizontal journeys, opening applications, opening deep links inside applications, easily sharing from one to the other. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is um, do something very risky um, and do a live demo. Um, doing live demos with voice is tricky, so hope the um, demo gods are with me. But I'd like to show what it means to have it assist. To be useful, it needs to be fast. Uh, it needs to be there, very natural. Um, so, I'll, uh, in the last you know couple of years, uh, our speech team has uh, gone through a, a technological um, innovation where, rather than having all of the speech models running on the server uh, with more than hundreds of gigabytes uh, of models, we've shrunk everything down so that it fits on your phone. And that allows us to be really fast. You know, uh, both speech, under, uh, speech understanding as well as language understanding can happen on the device. So I'd like to show you what it means and, and how natural it can be. Open calendar. Open calculator. Open calculator. Open Twitter. Open maps. Set a timer for 20 minutes. Turn on the flashlight, turn it off, take a selfie. And here we go. So as you can see, like, this was very natural. It was not only fast, but also I didn't have to say, hey, Google, all the time. By having access to natural language understanding, what we can do is we can go into a mode that we're calling continued conversation. So once you invoke the assistant, you can continue interacting with the assistant uh, until, uh, you know, un un until you stop. And it helps make things a lot more natural to interact with. Um, so the next thing I'd like to show is how Google Assistant can be helpful with applications. Um, so one of the things that it needs to do uh, to add value is to easily get you into the applications that you use on a regular basis. So I'll show a, a couple of examples. Show me John Legend on Twitter. Show me Beyonce on Instagram. Now on YouTube. Here we go. So. So being able to jump into the applications is something that the Google Assistant can do, because these applications have given the deep links to Google, and we can directly get you into the right place at the right time. Um, but that's not enough. Uh, you can also do searches inside your applications. I'll show you a couple of examples like that. Show me Italian restaurants on Maps. Show me um, funny videos on YouTube. Okay, playing funny videos on YouTube. So as you can see, you can you can also do. Uh, you, you can also do these searches where you can just uh, not only directly get into the application, but you can easily search. However, one thing that we've added is to have the Google Assistant be helpful while you're inside an application or inside a web page. So I'll, I'll, I'd like to show you an example. Open IMDB. Shape of Water. Who directed this movie? Here we go. So when I just said Shape of Water, 
because the IMDB web page was in the foreground, we were able to take you directly to IMDB and, and, and get things done. You can imagine the same thing happening with applications as well that you use on a regular basis. So for instance, if I have, if I have maps open, I can just say Italian restaurants and have Italian restaurants query issued uh, to, uh, to, to maps. Um, but this can not only apply to, of course, Google applications, but also our partner applications as well. So I can do something like open wall. What about white running shoes? So as you can see, the assistant can understand the context and pass the query to the app that is in the foreground. And the user can use the assistant and interact with your applications. Um, so what I'd like to end with is uh, how this can all come together in you know, user multitasking throughout the day. Um, so a lot of uh, what happens on a mobile device is messaging. So in this case, let's say that I got a message on a, a trip that I recently took to New York. Um, and I can just uh, quickly find photos that I want and, and, and have a conversation. Show me my photos from New York. The ones with dinosaurs. Share this with Beishad. Reply, the trip was great, and I can't wait to tell you all about it. So just like that, because the app is in the foreground, again, you can have a very natural interaction through the Google Assistant with this application. You can find what you want, you can multitask, and all of this can come together because Google Assistant orchestrates what the user wants with all of the different services that are on your phone. So what I just showed, were a series of integrations. I showed you know, the ability to be able to easily deep link into an application, to be able to easily interact with that application. Um, what I haven't shown is also the applications can show not only data inside the application, but also inside the assistant. You can also search within these applications through Google Assistant. And all of this is coming together through this new uh, service that we have that we're calling App Actions. And App Actions is very, very simple. It's a very lightweight way to enable the applications that you have. Um, you know, the average integration takes about 20 hours or so. And with a very light interaction, the uh, application developer can give us you know, the, the support to deep links inside their applications, uh, you know, ser uh, support search, uh, and just tell the Google Assistant, you know, connect what they can do with what Google Assistant understands. All of this can be done all natively within the application, so that uh, the interaction, uh, the integration is very lightweight and very fast. So we've been working with a couple of partners. Um, so I'd like to showcase a couple of them. Uh, one of them is PayPal. You can just say, you know, hey, Go hey Google, send $15 to Lillian on PayPal. And because the PayPal application has done the integration, uh, you can just directly get the user into PayPal with Lillian selected, with $15 uh, set, and all you need to do is just confirm. Um, another example is food ordering. You can say, hey, Google, order uh, bla uh, blueberry crisp signature latte from Dunkin'. And because Dunkin' has done the integration in a very lightweight way, where they give us, these are the you know, quick inventory that I have on my, uh, on my application, and this is the deep link for that. We can just take the user directly to that area, and the user just can uh, add it to their cart. And finally, health and fitness. Uh, you know, right before you're about to go for a run, you can just say, hey, Google, start my run on, the Nike, uh, on Nike and your run will start without the user having to find where the app is, go to start my run and, and, and do it. So voice becomes a very natural way on a mobile device to interact with these applications. It accelerates tasks and it connects the outcome that the user wants with the services. And I believe that is the key and, and, and also all of these are very, very lightweight integrations that can happen uh, by working with our partners. So just to recap, 
we believe we're at the cusp of the next paradigm shift. Uh, what we'd like to do is we'd like to extend the applications and you know, connect them to a, a lot more natural way uh, of interacting with them so that the users can just say the outcome and get things done. Um, the way we want to do that is by b bringing the assistant deeply into the operating system and by having it connect to these applications. And, and the message for all of our partners is we can do that through lightweight integrations, uh, you know, through app actions, through multimodal interactions, so that voice becomes a very natural, very lightweight way to get things done on a mobile device. So that concludes what I uh, would like to talk about. You know, we are really excited about bringing app actions to our partners. Uh, and we believe through this lightweight interaction, we can enable the next paradigm shift. Um, partnerships are really important. Uh, and what I'd like to do now is I'd like to invite Matt uh, from American Express onto stage to talk about the innovation that they've uh, had uh, by interaction with, with Google Assistant. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. All right, hi everyone. So while they're bringing up um, my presentation, I wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Matt Sioka. I'm from the Amex Digital Labs innovation team. We are tasked with working across Amex's different businesses across the world to inspire innovation and to become essential to our customers' digital lives. So today I'm gonna talk a little bit about a few things. Um, many of you in the room are brands or companies that are invested in the voice space or helping other brands invest in the voice space. So before I go into an exciting announcement about our new partnership with Google, I did want to explain a little bit about how does Amex approach innovation? How do we think about some of these new technologies? Voice is a great example. There's a whole host of different new technologies, products, platforms at CES this year. And it can be difficult to navigate. How do you figure out what matters for you and your brand and your business? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that first. Uh, is there a clicker? Is there a clicker? Um, or if you could advance to the next slide, please. So innovation, as I was mentioning, plays a key role in um, how we can deliver the mission that we have, which is to try to transform our customer experience. If you think about it at the core, oh, thanks. If you think about it at the core, Amex is really a services brand. And we are not just a bank, we're not just a network or a financial institution. We're trying to bring products to market that make our customers' lives better, and we aspire to have the world's best customer experience for them every single day. So how do you go about doing that? Well, innovation plays a key role. You've, you've heard earlier this morning multiple panels and speakers talking about the rise of the use of uh, smart devices, connected speakers, virtual assistants. What does that mean? It means all consumers out there um, in B2B environments as well, it's changing where people spend their time. It's changing their behaviors. It's enabling things like the ability for folks with certain disabilities to participate in a different way, as we heard on the earlier panel. All of these things, maybe in certain pockets, are smaller in their adoption, but there's some kernel of inspiration there where you can start to think about, well, where might this scale or how might this transform what people do in their daily lives? That's why we think about innovation and, and how we think about this mission of providing the world's best customer experience every day. It means we need to understand and see those trends and we need to figure out how to meet customers where they are so that we can continue to evolve as they evolve themselves. So what does it mean for Amex? There are a few different ways we've translated the kind of innovation and this need to transform the customer experience uh, to meet the needs of our, our consumers and our merchants and other partners. First, it's making what we call membership mobile. Um, mobile is not a novel thing to say, certainly not at CES. When you think about it in a financial services context, though, there's still a long way to go. There's a lot more that financial institutions could do to make their experiences more mobile-centric because that's the way that our users are living their lives. So there's a big focus for us on making things more mobile. Secondly, as I mentioned, we always look for new technology, not just new technology for the sake of new technology, but new technology that actually solves a customer need. 
I can't tell you how many times someone has pitched a blockchain idea to me that actually doesn't provide a better solution or isn't better than an alternative that someone already uses, but it has the word blockchain in it, so that's cool. Why don't you invest in that? So it's really important to figure out, with all of these great ideas and technologies and platforms, what is it actually doing and solving for you or for your customers or for the, the objectives that you're trying to accomplish? And keeping that centricity around the user is really, really important as you navigate all of these different opportunities. Thirdly, we work closely with partners. Um, most you know, brands in the room will realize, and even the, you know, our, our large partners like Google and Amazon um, as part of this event, um, all will tell you that partnerships are critical. There are only so many companies that could invest to make the best natural language processing capabilities in the world. There are only so many ways you can reach customers if they have different brands' devices in their homes or smartphones in their pockets. So partnerships become essential, and we, we know that and we recognize that. And then lastly, maintaining trust and security. So there was a lot of debate earlier today about privacy and consumer sentiment and where will people be comfortable or you know, what use cases will resonate or not. That's something we think about. But uh, I wanted to talk about messaging because I think there are some interesting corollaries to sort of the rise of messaging and all the proliferations we're seeing around messaging as a, a preferred communication mode for many users. And I, I'll come back to voice at the end where I think we can start to see maybe some parallels or learnings. So um, many of you have probably experienced on your own or seen you know, across different age cohorts the rise of texting, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, all of these different means of communication. You can look at whatever research source you want, they all say similar things, which is there are a lot of users across age groups, it's not just concentrated to younger customers, who prefer to message. And you have to kind of look underneath that and say, well, why? What's the use case or what's the user need that it's solving? Um, and I'll give you a few examples that really highlight the power of messaging. One example is messaging is asynchronous. So what does that mean? It means in my daily life, if I want to fire off a message to someone, I don't need to be in a captive conversation with you. Whether it's on the phone or a web-based chat, I can send it off, I can walk into a meeting, I can go to school if I'm a student, I can jump in the subway and lose connectivity if there's no connectivity, and I can pick up the conversation where I left off later. That's one core value of messaging that users love, and there are certain use cases and certain user segments where they prefer to communicate in this way. So we see, we've seen that trend many years ago. We started to figure out what does it mean for American Express? What can we do? So we created a mobile assistant. Someone earlier on a panel predicted more financial institutions will all have assistants and things like that. So we, we have one. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it today. Essentially, when we picked up on these trends, we started figuring out, well, what could we put in the Amex mobile app? What would that assistant do? What would it be like? And we kind of blended a variety of things. We had all of these capabilities internally at Amex that we had built that give customers automated information. So your account balance or you, know, you need a replacement card. There are journeys that you could do through our digital channels. We decided to do it in a messaging environment within our app. But that wasn't enough. We wanted to do more. So we acquired a company in 2018 called Mezzi that had a app-based mobile travel assistant. Uh, and it was a blend of automation with actual live agents in the background, they could help you find a hotel. They could help you while you're on a business trip in Vegas, you need a dinner location for a business meeting, what's a good you know, recommended restaurant that fits all those requirements? Or maybe you need that in Copenhagen or Paris or somewhere else in the world. So we put the power of all of these different things right in the Amex mobile app. So this is live today, uh, eligible customers can get information about their accounts, get card servicing, they can book travel and dining. And again, it's a blend of automated experiences with human-assisted agent interaction for certain more complex journeys where the agent is just the right way to give the customer what they want. So 
let's step back into the voice space, which is what we're here to talk about today. Um, how many of you, I'm going to take a quick poll, how many of you use a virtual assistant on a daily, regular basis? Okay, almost everyone, not quite everyone. How many of you have used that assistant to interact with a personal financial account? All right, <laughs> I only see about three hands. So that's something we want to change. Um, so I'm excited to announce today a new partnership with Google. We've been working with the Google Assistant team to allow you to interact and get information about your Amex accounts through the Google Assistant platform. So again, going back into that innovation mindset, what's going on with voice, why do we care about this, we looked back and we saw uh, some interesting data points. Um, first, two-thirds of consumers who are using assistance are actually, they say they're comfortable doing banking use cases through those platforms. So, you know, privacy is still a challenge, security is still a challenge, but there's some intention and some convenience or some other factors driving that desire. That was something we found very interesting. Um, in addition to that, as I was talking earlier about trying to provide the best customer experience every day, we have this philosophy of meeting customers where they are and providing choice. So you've seen multiple data points earlier in the session today. Google Assistant available on over a billion devices. You don't need to have the home speaker in your home to use it. You don't need to have a Google Pixel phone to use it. You can use it on iOS as well. We love the idea that we want to provide customers choice. Many of our customers choose to use the Google Assistant platform, and we wanted to meet them there. Secondly, um, differentiated value. So I talked about not just taking a technology and using it, but how do you actually solve problems? So as we started testing through in the voice space, which we've been doing for the last three or so years, we've realized that there are times when using a phone or a mobile app actually isn't that convenient. I think you heard a few examples from panelists earlier today, but one example I like to give is, say you're at home, you're you know, washing dishes after dinner, your hands are wet, all of a sudden you realize, oh, when's my credit card due bill? I can't. I, I can't remember when it's due. Um, in that instance, pulling out your phone, toggling to your banking app, authenticating to open the app, and then getting the information, it's actually a lot of steps. It's not that convenient given what you're doing. Being able to talk to Google and say, hey, Google, when's my Amex bill due, is a lot easier and a lot more of a delightful experience. So we're hoping to bring more differentiated value like that through our partnership. And then lastly, operational efficiencies. There were some comments earlier about cost savings and things like that. I think um, one note of caution for all of, you, all of you as you think about it, I think there's a possibility for operational efficiency um, for sure, especially if you compare a typical voice call, um, customer service interaction to something through an assistant that might be a little bit more seamless. Doesn't servicing available to your customers. That being said, I, I found other brands or partners kind of struggle if they go about this pitching a case of, oh, this is all about cost savings. So it really needs to sort of balance out efficiency with value to the user and making sure it's something that customers will actually want to use. So why did we choose to work with Google? I mentioned a little bit about it before in terms of scale and meeting customers where they are. Um, but I also wanted to highlight that the a brand trust and security and privacy, those are things that are so important to American Express. We know they're so important to Google as well. So we share a lot of the same values as them. We spent a lot of time working through to make sure that the way that data was being used and protected was the right way, the right way, being done in the right way and being clearly communicated to customers who decided to opt into this experience. So that was something that is at the forefront. You'll see that um, in the experience and when we go live. So introducing the Amex action for Google Assistant, you'll be able to get your account balance information. You can ask about recent transactions. You can actually pay your credit card bill through Google Assistant. And we are excited to bring this to market, and it will be live in a few weeks, and I hope that you all will give it a try. So that's all that I have for today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Amex. I am a longtime Amex customer. Runs, it runs Motive, actually. Thank you, Amex. All right. Well, guess what?
and I'll use my hands. Okay, we're live. Okay, well, hey, thank you so much for joining us. We're here at the Voice Summit, live from CES. It's a one-day event, very, very exciting to be here. We're here at the Google Assistant booth. They are a presenting sponsor. Can you please introduce yourself? Hey, Ashwin Karate. Hi, I'm Naomi Mikowski. All right, so Ashwin and Naomi, thank you for being here. We genuinely appreciate your support awesome and all the things that you're doing here for us. Can you tell us a bit about the Golden Ticket and the uh, Home Nest? Okay, hi, right. Golden Ticket. So we're excited to be here at Voice Live at CES. First time event. It's great to see the excitement and enthusiasm. Google the system is a sponsor of it. But, like, we're going to continue doing this. I'm glad to, to see the turnout. There's a big line for me. Yeah. And, <laughs> and <laughs> there's a bunch of things that we're doing for the audience. So, yeah, so we're really excited to be giving out um, our home hub, right? So that's one of the giveaways. Here we can show it to everyone. Feel like I'm commercial. Um, but even more exciting, I think, is our golden ticket. So this gives advanced access um, to our Google Assistant journey. So hopefully everyone will go check it out, enjoy it, post a bunch of photos, and we'll see you guys around the conference. All right. Well, the hashtag for this event is Voice 2020. CS 2020. Voice 2020. And have anything for the Google Assistant? Hashtag Google Assistant. All right. Hey, Google. Hey, Google. Well, on behalf. Hey, Google. That's right. Well, on behalf of everybody at the voice industry, thanks for everything that you and your team do to push this along and it's helping a lot of people we're very grateful and for all of you that got a chance to get to know these folks you're welcome you. stay with us we'll be back with more <laughs> Do you spend time on what makes you feel alive? 10,000 years ago, the first agricultural revolution gave parents more certainty they could feed their children. What comes next will give you more time to do what makes you feel alive. And all you need is the voice you already have. Voice is the easiest way to create and monetize content at scale. Your productivity will skyrocket as you get things done at the speed of speech voice technology as your new operating system gives you and every other living human greater control over your own destiny visit attn.live now to create your own connected and abundant future Do you spend time on what makes you feel alive? 10,000 years ago, the first agricultural revolution gave parents more certainty they could feed their children. What comes next will give you more time to do what makes you feel alive. And all you need is the voice you already have. Voice is the easiest way to create and monetize content at scale. Your productivity will skyrocket as you get things done at the speed of speech voice technology as your new operating system gives you and every other living human greater control over your own destiny. Visit attn.live now to create your own connected and abundant future.
Once again, welcome to the Voice Summit live here at CNN's John and Emerson and so spoken. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so nice to meet everybody. Uh, Being yes, interviewed by you is always the highlight of any conference experience. Yeah, I'd uh, say that sincerely. She really told is. me that, but I said, oh, man, I, I don't pay enough to say that, but yeah, I believe you. <laughs> yeah, but tell, tell us about okay. you. I, 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 I genuinely love your company and the stuff that you're doing in the market, so I want all of them to know about it. So we do testing, tuning, and monitoring for voice experiences. Uh, we work with uh, Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant. Uh, we provide automated and functional testing, so just making sure the basics are working, to even very sophisticated monitoring, as well as speech recognition tuning, which are all really essential. Since we first met at when you were to John as the leader, and how you evangelize? Sure, so uh, I think even more so than web and mobile, the whole automation in and optimizing the whole lot at the lightning speed of machine. Uh, it's, it's great, but it, it, at least that's what you're like, very limited by their case to very reliably, very rapidly scaling those types of results. The very deep analysis of the engine is, is just extremely high. Absolutely. The folks that aren't here, who are the type of folks that should be reaching out either directly, you know, small business to engage with the website? For one thing, we started the company because we believe that what we do is everything. They are now pushing all these people into building AI-based experiences. Not everyone is fully aware of what the implications of that are. I am just because I spend a lot of time with people that you need to be out. Everybody should be using it. That said, um, you know, accepted that reality. Or they're, you know, they're not fully committed enough to it. And, uh, people are putting better voice experiences uh, as well. As, um, we do see other wonderful stuff out there. It's phenomenal. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of stuff happening with voice. But we really love those two areas. Uh, so if you're a home automation company, you can figure out you know, how do you test these things. You know, maybe even sort of dragged into doing voice. You didn't necessarily think it was the highest priority, but you know, being uh, Alexa, Google Assistant enabled, is now table stakes work as well. You can super to have a great experience on this uh, new platform. When somebody comes, like Jen's the CEO of Info, if she comes, I think they need to be doing testing. They need to be tuning. Should it be... I'm going to anything, or I'm going there to use a tool, and I'm empowered to use the tool myself or my team. Is it more like, of course, it's software and services that you're doing all that? It is a suite of tools and solutions that we actively start using them. Simply like to set up and to write and maintain that you really are amazed how, how they can internalize very late their development cycle, but they have a very limited team that just they right. the regions that they can perhaps apply that as well. Okay. Do you have any questions, Jim? No, I mean, frankly, I should be like that. Uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you, Highlight. Let me tell you something. I think, especially in the tech industry, it's yeah. really important for every company to have a mascot or have it with all the tools. Yeah. So the llama loves And if you come visit us in our headquarters in Lima, Peru, you can see the llama. We can actually get it. We need to go to Peru, so I guess that's another reason. You have it. Is there a story behind the llama? I will be banned to step in. They actually should just make sure they're working great. I love yeah. it. Uh, I'm JP. We are the spoken by all the time. And I should also say, if you look at uh, looking at on Twitter now, we just did these predictions. I did a new podcast with uh, Excel. Right. Making uh, lots of bold statements about future voice. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of thought we put into it. I hope people will listen to it. Um, not just. Hopefully, final we're saying interesting, but also give me feedback because we're also trying to find. Yeah, well, there's two types of futurists. There's real futurists based on science, knowledge, and fact. John. And there's fake futurists based on passion and fantasy. Or like a personality test. Like, say, I'll be futurist. It's on my LinkedIn. Very nice. We both very, the very nice. I just tell everybody I'm a fake futurist. I just say, right, though. If you get enough predictions, try to do. Yeah. I think that's a great thing about technology. Amazon is to be a Star Trek computer. It's amazing. Well, guys, I find out more about you. So, if you want to find out more, congratulations, you found us. Uh, bespoken, bespoken.io, at bespoken.io on all social. Uh, check them out, and we'll be back in just a moment.
Welcome to Voice. Whoa. From the main stage to our breakout sessions to the expo hall, I think we had more than 500 companies speaking at this conference. It has become the place where the global voice first communities are coming together. There's just so many affordances that speech give us. It's the first time in my life that my kids are just as excited and up to speed on the tech as my parents, right? This would reduce your balance to about $15,000 that is the experience you want to have when you introduce Conversational AI. 2019 sales to date are up 2.1%. How do you use voice and empathy and build that into an experience that's going to work in a healthcare context from people who are developing gaming applications? And we learn from that. So the cross-industry pollination, very important and very helpful for us. Coming back one year later and seeing how much this conference has grown, how many more women, frankly, I'm seeing in the space, has been really like impactful to me personally. I think very valuable for Boom as a company to find so many great people to meet and potentially partner with. The talent now better understand what it is that they need to do and how they can participate in this new world of voice first and AI. The world is changing so fast. The voice, the augmented reality, virtual reality, this is gonna be huge. This is the inaugural Voice Summit Awards. This community is innovating at a pace that I don't think any industry has ever seen before. I want us to all give a round of applause for the people in this room that are changing the world. The thing I love most is watching all the connections, all the smiles, seeing all the tweets of people having a great time together. My definition of voice is the ability to empower others. It's time to take this to another level where you and I can make an even bigger impact. To the 5,000 people that came from more than 26 countries, five continents, every state in this union, from me to you, thank you very much. Do you earn enough money to do more than just survive? 500 years ago, Gutenberg's printing press gave people control over their education and income. What comes next will help you earn more money. And all you need is the voice you already have. Voice is the easiest way to create and monetize content at scale. Your productivity will skyrocket as you get things done at the speed of speech. Voice technology as your new operating system gives you and every other living human greater control over your own destiny. Visit ATTN.LIVE now to create your own connected and abundant future. From the main stage to our breakout sessions to the expo hall, I think we had more than 500 companies speaking at this conference. It has become the place where the global voice first communities are coming together. There's just so many affordances that speech give us. It's the first time in my life that my kids are just as excited and up to speed on the tech as my parents, right? This would reduce your balance to about $15,000. That is the experience you want to have when you introduce Conversational AI. 2019 sales to date are up 2.1%. How do you use voice and empathy and build that into an experience that's going to work in a healthcare context 
from people who are developing gaming applications, and we learn from that. So the cross-industry pollination, very important and very helpful for us. Coming back one year later and seeing how much this conference has grown, how many more women, frankly, I'm seeing in the space, has been really like impactful to me personally. I think very valuable for Boom as a company to find so many great people to meet and potentially partner with. The talent now better understand what it is that they need to do and how they can participate in this new world of voice first and AI. The world is changing so fast. The voice, the government of reality, virtual reality, this is gonna be huge. This is the inaugural Voice Summit Awards. This community is innovating at a pace that I don't think any industry has ever seen before. I want us to all give a round of applause for the people in this room that are changing the world. The thing I love most is watching all the connections, all the smiles, seeing all the tweets of people having a great time together. My definition of voice is the ability to empower others. It's time to take this to another level where you and I can make an even bigger impact. To the 5,000 people that came from more than 26 countries, five continents, every state in this union, from me to you, thank you very much.